Andrea Dworkin, problematic, once wrote, You won't ever know the worst that happened to Nicole Brown Simpson in her marriage, because she is dead and cannot tell you. And if she were alive, remember, you wouldn't believe her. The essay, in memory of Nicole Brown Simpson, excerpted from Dworkin's book, Last Days at Hot Slit, goes on to describe the last footage of Nicole ever taken, shortly after her daughter, Sydney's dance recital on the afternoon of June 12, 1994, a few short hours before Nicole's death. She writes, Remember the video showing Simpson after the ballet recital with the Brown family, introduced by the defense to show Simpson's pleasant demeanor? Hours later, Nicole Simpson was dead. In the video, she is as far from Simpson physically as she can manage. He does not nod or gesture to her. He kisses her mother, embraces and kisses her sister, and bear hugs her father. They all reciprocate. She must have been the loneliest woman in the world. Nicole Brown was 18 years and five weeks old when she met Orenthal James Simpson, while waitressing at the Daisy in Beverly Hills. O.J., as he preferred to be called, then a month shy of his 30th birthday, was already a celebrated athlete boasting a Heisman Trophy and a blossoming film career. From the moment they met, O.J. would become the dominant figure in Nicole's life until her death at the age of 35, casting a shadow over nearly half of her life. We won't ever know the worst that happened to Nicole Brown Simpson in her marriage, because she is dead and cannot tell us. But now, OJ is dead too, and can no longer speak over her. And it is my hope that over the next hour, two hours, three hours and change, however long we're stuck here, relentlessly dragging his fetid, wife-beating corpse, that something of Nicole's voice comes through. That in death, she is no longer the loneliest woman in the world. Welcome back to Respect the Dead, the podcast where we don't. Sweaty, it's no surprise that everybody celebrated your demise. And now, worms are eating your eyes. So don't you worry your rotten head as you sleep in your sodden bed. It's time to respect the Orenthal? <laughs> oh my god, you didn't know his name was Orenthal? No! <laughs> hey, oh my god. Let's go. <laughs> this is going to be the most respect the dead episode that ever respected the dead. <laughs> He's Orenthal, baby. He's Orenthal, and he didn't know his name was Orenthal until the third grade, because everybody always called him OJ, until the third grade when his teacher read out his name, and he was like, who the fuck is that? (laughs) (laughs) Ah! Orenthal! Orenthal what? Orenthal James. Okay. Oh, they really had to go, like, have these on that one, eh? Like, yeah, <laughs> we were gonna go like Orenthal Blumenthal, but we thought that was a little <laughs> too much. So yeah, Orenthal Blumenthal sounds like a shoe salesman or something. Yeah, but one who's like the quirky one. He's not there. He's not there to sell shoes. You know what mm. I mean? He's there, he's for there the to fix my pipes. Oh yeah, that 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 too. <laughs> that too. <laughs> I'm a, I'm imagining a very specific kind of man, mustache oh, okay. and horn rim glasses. Yeah. Oh, okay. You're you're thinking like old and timey, like a cobbler, yeah. less mm-hmm. like I work at Foot Locker on the weekends <laughs> because I like to touch the feet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It never even occurred to me that you didn't know that his name was Orenthal, so I didn't put anything about that, like his teacher or anything like that, in my script. I. I will say, I think it's in like the documentary OJ Made in America. There's like a clip of him going on some kind of a talk show where somebody asks him what uh, OJ stood for. And he even pronounces it wrong in that talk show. Like there are other times where he pronounces it (laughs) Orenthal. But in the talk show in the 70s, he was like Orenthal. Oh, oh, oh. But then other times it's Orenthal. And then it's it's spelled Orenthal. 
So I think he just like was getting used to what his actual name was like earlier on and mispronounced his own name. Nobody ever called him that. They called him OJ. That's just so funny though. It's so weird that you would never know what your actual, that you wouldn't know what your actual name was until you were in the third grade. Just never bothered to ask. He used to think his name was like O-J-A-Y or something. (laughs) O-J. He's like, wait. It's easy to spell. Those are two letters? (laughs) I'm just two letters? That's she's so, so alphabet pilled. <laughs> oh my god, we've already like hit the ground running. Hey everyone, I'm Hoots. <laughs> oh right, I'm Kaylin. <laughs> we have a podcast to do. <laughs> oh, um, and we're like on your channel. Oh my god, we are on my channel for this. One. Hi Hoots' channel. Hi Hoots' channel. This is my podcast. Welcome. If, if you're like, who the fuck is that? What are we doing? There's the theme song now. Oh, my God. Yeah, this is an episode of my podcast. This is a special episode of our podcast. We're talking O.J. Simpson today because he died like a month ago at the time of this recording. Yeah, and we were getting a lot of messages. We had just released like one other huge episode and people were like, that's nice. O.J. when? Okay, but O.J. (laughs) when? You're doing O.J., right? When can we expect O.J.? O.J. when? It's so like. Early on in our podcast, we started to experience this phenomenon that, like, you described, Kaylin, as, like, people acting like we are the Grim Reaper themselves, like, going down to Earth. My phone blows (laughs) up when somebody dies. I'm getting notifications. There's comments on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. Somebody found my TikTok which is basically a cemetery (laughs) and like commented on one of my videos. It was like, I didn't think you'd see it on Twitter because you have more followers, but you don't hear. (laughs) What are you covering this person? I was like, damn, okay. Oh, I thought I would bless your TikTok with some engagement and let you know that OJ died. Yeah. Like it's like they, (laughs) they expect us to like collect the souls and take them down to hell ourselves. And like, I don't I don't even have to have notifications on for celebrity deaths because like our our Somebody podcast else fans yes. are our notifications. I know the second any celebrity dies. <laughs> I do I do have notifications on for that one Twitter account, Celeb Death Alerts. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think our our, th- most... our official podcast follows that on Twitter. It's just like us <laughs> and Celeb Death Alerts. Celeb Death Alerts. <laughs> and like uh... Liza Minnelli outlives. <laughs> <laughs> okay well that's iconic yeah so every episode of respect the dead has it just comes with like a general content warning because we talk about like bad stuff and bad people Everything. yeah but i'm just gonna give a little extra warning at the top for all of the intimate partner violence that we're gonna be talking about um mm. because I don't know how our listeners feel, but the way I feel is that like sometimes like the tiny little interpersonal things are more upsetting to listen to than, you know, like the genocides we casually discuss on this podcast. One of them is more likely to be like personally Personal. Triggering. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> as like as opposed to just like completely upsetting. devastating to your entire being. There's yeah. like the little the little sharp moments in this podcast where I'm like, oh, that is I think because we highlight like very specific people, like mm-hmm. zoning in, or z- zooming in on one person and like hearing about their lives and like the things that they've done can often be like yeah. a lot more affecting because it's yeah. a person as opposed to like a, a concept. A statistic. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, like I, I feel like there's like this unspoken respect the dead guarantee that we will like ruin your night. But like mm-hmm. – we don't want to trigger your PTSD. So <laughs> we yeah, do want to make you feel bad. In a fun way. Yeah. <laughs> Not like, that like bad. damn. I'm crying because I'm laughing and also because that was horrible and not like I'm going to go lay in the bathtub in the dark right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if this episode isn't for you, feel free to skip it. Come back another time or don't. I don't care. Live your life. <laughs> I won't know. I won't I'm know. I'm dead. <laughs> yeah, clearly. Oh, yeah. Look, look fun, at these skeleton fun respect hands. the dead lore. <laughs> we're both dead. Yeah. And this is the only way that we're ever going to get out of purgatory is, is by talking shit about other corpses. Okay. That would be amazing. Yeah. 
we have a quota. Get to purgatory. <laughs> they're like, there's a way out of this. Like you can you can get to <laughs> You heaven. have to start a and podcast. We're like, <laughs> we're like, what is it? <laughs> they're like, okay, you're not gonna believe this. Because <laughs> it sounds counterintuitive. Because all podcasters usually do go to hell. <laughs> but... <laughs> but first, this episode is also sponsored by a friend of the podcast, Ground News. Kaylin, have you heard of Ground News, the website and app that allows you to sort through every article on any given story to compare coverage and spot media bias? I know that they've heard of me. <laughs> oh. oh no they're gonna because they're you're a celebrity <laughs> let's cut that out I forgot that they're actually gonna see this and you have to send this to them <laughs> okay. I did tell them when I, I sent them a script and I was like hey I've got my podcast co-host so this is like just general like it could it could go anywhere anything could happen okay on a podcast <laughs> I'm keeping this all um, in yes I've worked with ground news before you have let me show you my my viewers and listeners, how some of it works. So we're here on the Ground News homepage. Let's just search O.J. Simpson. Oh, this is a good one. Reactions to O.J. Simpson's death. What do the celebrities think? Instantly, we can see more than 50 articles published on this topic. The bias distribution map shows us that headlines under this topic are all center and right-leaning publications, which makes sense because conservatives love a little tabloid goss. And it looks like most of the stories are about Caitlyn Jenner's, quote, heartless and tacky response to OJ's death. Gotta love Caitlyn Jenner for generating bipartisan disdain. The left hates her because she's a cruel right-wing capo who got away with vehicular manslaughter. And the right hates her because she's trans. Which is worse? There's no way to know. <laughs> Ground News has tons of features and they're fully unlocked with the Vantage plan. You can subscribe through my link or scan the QR code for 40% off unlimited access to everything Ground News offers. But plans can start at just a dollar a month. I'm a Pisces, Pisces moon, so I really need to work at practicing critical thinking, which is why I use Ground News to help me see through media narratives, and then I can make informed decisions. Having a tool like Ground News will help you sort through the bullshit, my fellow water signs. Check out the link in my description, ground.news slash hoots, to give yourself the right tools to be informed without being misinformed. Okay, so... O.J. Simpson. <laughs> you ready? Blumenthal Julian Simpson. <laughs> That's right. Orange Julius Simpson. <laughs> okay. I think I thought it was Orlando. Ooh, Orlando's a cute name. I like Orlando. Yeah. Like, Orlando's a nice name. Did he live in Florida, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine being Wait, born I... in Orlando and named Orlando. <laughs> I would do it. Like, I think to most... my hypothetical children. I think most Orlandos are named after the the Shakespeare character. I would definitely I name my child after where I lived. This is my baby, two bedroom. <laughs> my, oh, you're so lucky because my baby would be named Studio. <laughs> this is my bed. I love my that. bed. Studio hoots. <laughs> <laughs> this is where the magic happens. <laughs> <laughs> now we're just stalling because we don't want to talk about OJ. I hate him. <laughs> Everything I know about him was from like dramatic reenactments. One of them, that Ryan Murphy one, uh, American Crime Story. Right. Which I have not watched. And I I kind of went back and forth about whether to watch it. You will watch any Ryan movies. Murphy. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's the same thing, basically. Yeah. <laughs> like... <laughs> I was kind of went back and forth about whether I wanted to watch it like in the preparation for this video episode, but I kind of decided that like maybe watching a fictionalized version of the case wouldn't be as yeah. helpful. But I think I will watch it maybe like after I think we you finish should. this. I yeah. found it I found it really engaging. And I mean, I I do stand mm -hmm. Sarah Paulson in pretty much everything, but they made her so like plain in this. Who did she play? The prosecutor oh Marcia? cool Marsha. yeah Marsha. okay is that mm -hmm. is that someone the fact that you... i remember that but i have like i don't remember like my best friends like best friends <laughs> names it's fine it's whatever we will not be talking about Marsha clark today because okay. uh, i 
I ended up DMing Kaylin at like 10 o'clock last night and I was like, so I'm like 15 <laughs> pages in and I'm like just getting to the start of the murder. So this is going to be a multi-parter, everyone, because <laughs> okay, so we, no, we can't sit here for six hours. No murder today. No murder today. Murder okay. next time. Trial next time. <laughs> okay. Oh, weird life in Las Vegas next time. Okay, perfect. <laughs> but- one of the things that I, like, noticed, like, while I was doing my research for this is, like, half of the, like, articles and books and, like, documentaries on O.J. Simpson are called things like an American tragedy and, like, made in America, American hero. Like, this is a fellow for white guys who wear wraparound Oakley sunglasses. Like, this is yeah. this is their tragedy. They're, like... He, what a fall from grace football it, to murder i was like didn't he play like golf or something <laughs> he he did play golf towards the end okay. but that was more of like okay. a that was what he did hanging out with his white uh white i was like american hero who plays bros. golf like what a it's not even a real sport <laughs> if there's no real chance of a concussion i don't think it's a real sport that's, well that's he, where i draw my line i think he got a lot of concussions so we're, we're oh right in football. We're in a good place. Yeah. We're in a good place. Yeah, yeah. amazing. It's a okay, real go. sport. Okay, let's get to those concussions. OJ's murder trial was called the trial of the century, and it kind of lived up to that title because it really kind of sat at this weird intersection of race and class and gender and celebrity and media that sort of came to define the 1990s and portend the coming millennium. Orenthal James Simpson. The way I born... just light up when I hear it. <laughs> Orenthal James Simpson was born July 9th, 1947. What's his zodiac? Which means he was a cancer, which is so he funny was. because cancer is what got him in the end. <gasps> oh my god it's the circle of life yeah it truly is born born by the cancer die by the cancer yeah <laughs> his mother eunice was an orderly at a psych ward and his father jimmy was a custodian and a cook jimmy would separate from eunice when oj was only four so oj and his brother and sister were pretty much entirely raised by his mom and oj was a lifelong mama's boy he loved his mother OJ grew up in Potrero Hill, uh, the Potrero Hill neighborhood of San Francisco, which was gentrified during the dot-com boom of the 1990s. But at the time OJ was growing up, it was the projects. Potrero Hill took the kind of journey that a lot of neighborhoods that get gentrified took, where um, probably because it began as a poor working class neighborhood where rents were low, all of the artists and the gays started moving in. So by the 1960s, when OJ reached his teens, his neighborhood was one of San Francisco's like LGBT hotbeds, which is interesting because OJ's dad, Jimmy, was rarely around when OJ was growing up because Jimmy was actually gay and he was a well-known drag queen in the Bay Area. I would have uh, loved Eunice too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I still would have been around to be a dad. I, I think he still lived in the neighborhood, but he just like didn't really care about his. I would have been like, bye, much. girl. I'm mother now. <laughs> bye, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> See you on the news. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and oh, would he? <laughs> <laughs> in the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary, I cribbed most of the information for this podcast from OJ Made in America. <laughs> One of one of Shout OJ's out friends. To you, James <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's okay to it's okay to plagiarize on podcasts. Nobody cares. Our job is just to be yeah. funny. It's not actually to know anything. That's so true. And <laughs> very lucky for us. Yeah. It's transformative. This is fair use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so one of OJ's friends described running up to OJ's dad's house when they were kids and spotting a man in a bathrobe behind Jimmy when he answered the door. And realizing that OJ's dad was gay. And when he brought it up to OJ, OJ did not respond very well. OJ rarely ever talked about his father and the two were estranged for most of his life. And I mean, part of that definitely is because Jimmy abandoned him when he was four. Yeah. But a lot of it 
by like all the people who knew OJ was also assumed to be because OJ was like very uncomfortable with the fact that he was gay. He kind of refused to talk about it and was like profoundly homophobic, which is, I guess like (laughs) it's, it's not surprising for a boomer to be homophobic, but it is surprising for a famous person to be homophobic. (laughs) You're around so many gays. How can you keep being homophobic all your life? I think it's different when it's sports, though. Like, but he became an actor, but like a real actor, or like a, <laughs> a bad, or actor, like somebody who still. used to play football who acted. A bad actor, but like, gay men were powdering his nose. Like, come on, like yeah. But I'm, I, I, I do think that in these situations, there's the kind of homophobia where if someone's like working for you, almost. It's yeah. just like any other kind They're of bigotry still beneath you. where it's like the yeah. help is obviously able to be a disgusting pervert that has nothing <laughs> to do with me. Like, <laughs> and if I want them to leave, I'll fire them. Everything's fine. <laughs> and I, I, I do get the, I would imagine that for a lot of homophobic people or really anyone from that time period, having a gay father, yeah, you would need to like, you would need to to be loudly anti-gay so that people didn't think you were also gay, like your gay dad. Like, I feel like that would definitely be a thing. And if you're getting made fun of, like, by proxy for having a gay dad, the way to make sure people know that, like, like, oh, I'm actually on your side is to also be just as loudly homophobic. So there's probably, like, yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, you're right. Something in there. Definitely. And also, but, everyone's dad is gay, and it's totally fine to hate your dad. It's fine. Yeah. Not for Gads- being gay, but... <laughs> Gadsby Day. <laughs> Jimmy Lee Simpson would end up dying in June of 1986. His obituary attributed his death to cancer, but Jeffrey mm-hmm. Tubin, the author of The Run of His Life, The People vs. O.J. Simpson, suggests that Jimmy may have actually died from complications due to AIDS. When you're like, um, gay guy dies late In 1986, 80s. yeah. Uh, of you're cancer. Like, oh. You're like, did he what? though? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, well, what kind of cancer? Like gay cancer, which is what they used to call <laughs> <Yeah>. it. Yeah. <laughs> Does the name Jeffrey Tubin ring a bell? The author of that book? Jeffrey Tubin was the journalist who got suspended by the New Yorker in 2020 for masturbating in a Zoom meeting. <laughs> Oops, amongst us. I've There's, actually okay. never been in a Zoom meeting, and I definitely wouldn't do that in one. But like, I don't know. His excuse was he, he said, thought his camera was off. That's <laughs> well. I don't think that's necessarily the actual issue that people would have had. Yeah, I think maybe it was the masturbation. But... Yeah, during an ongoing meeting. <laughs> Even if your camera was off and you thought people didn't know you were doing it, that actually that that makes it worse. Like, do you see how that makes it worse? Did they report on it? Yeah, like, from their own outlet. It was a it was a new yeah. It was like it was <laughs> That's like hilarious. It was reporting in every you're... outlet for for a while. Imagine your work <laughs> very funny like, publicizing that you were wanking like you're on like wank from a home because of the pandemic <laughs> like. <laughs> wank from home yeah he got suspended he did not get fired just suspended (laughs) just like take a little break with pay because you were fucking cranking it on camera in front of your co-workers can't anyway i bring it up because the oj simpson case is like full of like these little details like there's such a big cast of characters and like celebrity cameos even from people who were just like reporting on the murder case like it just keeps expanding out so you can like get into wikipedia free fall for like days if you try to google like any small aspect of this case and that is why this is a two-parter this is what happened to me with roy Cohn. yes (laughs) i was like who didn't he know who didn't he have some weird interaction with everyone (laughs) OJ grows up in a rough part of town, and he starts out as kind of a rough kid. He's in a lot of gangs. He's hanging out with a crowd that, like, pulls guns on each other, like, as pranks. Like, oh, watch this. This is going to be so funny. Gun to your head. 
He was arrested three times as an early teen, and he credited baseball star Willie Mays with persuading him to change his troublesome ways. So he started, I guess he met Willie Mays, and Willie Mays would be like, the youth should pull up Willie Mays was like hanging out with his weird little friends, and they're all pulling guns (laughs) on each other. Willie Mays was like, you know what? Enough of this. I'm going back to school. (laughs) Who's coming with me? (laughs) He started pouring his energy into sports, uh, first into high school track and then into high school football. And he's really, really fucking good at football. He's like, he's really good at running in general. He ends up being sought after by college recruiters because of his playing and ends up enrolling in a private, wealthy university in South LA called the University of Southern California. What you know makes her. him good at football? Do you just need to be like big and fast? It and, like, able depends to take a on kind of like it. De- it depends on the. Uh, I think all of them are able to take a hit, but it depends on the role that you play. He was a running back, which a big part of his is being able to run really quickly and really nimbly as well. The guy is fucking huge. He's like, I think he's like six one or six two, and he was like probably like two hundred pounds. I don't. I don't know weights. He was. He was like. Big but muscle and not like as broad gotcha. as like, I don't know, a quarterback back I think is supposed to be more broad. Right. So he's able to be like nimble and like hop between yeah. things. He's I not I mean, I guess I mean in the like, he's not like deep in the scrimmage. He's like running. He's taking the ball and running. Gotcha. And he was fucking amazing at that. So he also ran track at USC and he was very good at that. But Americans don't give a shit about track. So he like we want to go to a football yeah, game so up. he like he became a celebrity for football we want to watch football because we want to get drunk you don't get drunk at a track game you know you get drunk at a football game and I then you go home and beat your wife drunk at both <laughs> i would i would 100 percent need to be drunk at both you we just don't watch we just don't watch a track game <laughs> okay <fair>. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't even so, sound like a game <laughs> these bitches are just running like i can yeah. watch my cat do that exactly it's much more entertaining so cute (laughs) so annoying when they do it at four in the morning though yes yeah Uh, but i would imagine it would be annoying if oj was doing it too (laughs) so like as a kid he played a few different positions but like i said for most of his football career he was a running back and he was one of the greatest running backs of all time so like you and i don't give a shit about football but like holy shit oj could run so in oj and oj made in america there's like a lot of old footage of him in his college days at usc and it's like it's fucking insane like he's got the ball and he's running and these guys are chasing him and suddenly he's just like he warps across the field he's like suddenly he's like over there and you're like how the fuck did he get there i didn't see him run sideways like the man was nimble the man was nimble as fuck and like you don't really understand like how good he is until you actually see it in action and then you're like yeah i get it like i don't care about football but i do like see like somebody being you know like just an expert in their field, like a, a virtuoso yeah. in their field. And I'm like, Literally that is impressive. Field. Yeah. Like it is you, you, even if you don't know the game, you know that what he's doing is like amazing. Yeah. It's like technically impressive. Yeah. Bro was nimble. Um, so, <laughs> so is his dad. <laughs> I wish I had known no. Jimmy. I feel like I would have been friends with Jimmy. <laughs> I need to stop making like every murderer that you talk about. I need to stop calling them gay for like literally. Well, Jimmy no wasn't reason. a murderer. Jimmy did nothing no, wrong other than abandon his son. I was well. Maybe he contributed. Murderer, so abandoning yeah, him. Maybe was he fine. contributed. <laughs> he saw. Yeah. He, saw he was exactly. like he has, he has bad vibes. Yeah. Terrible this, vibes. This kid has a fucking nasty vibes. This kid no, is gonna was... grow up to be a wife beater. So I'm just gonna leave him with yeah. my wife. <laughs> I'm going to run sideways out of this motherfucking house. I'm going to be faster than my son ever will be on the way out the motherfucking door. Like I said, he becomes kind of a celebrity while he's a college football player. Like the whole nation is kind of like watching USC while OJ is playing. And specifically white men. White men love OJ in the 1960s. OJ made it his goal to an extent to transcend race 
He did not want to be perceived as a black man. He actually told a lot of his friends, I'm not black, I'm OJ. And I really think he was kind of successful in that endeavor. Remember, he's going to college in the late 60s. He started college in 1967. Yeah, 1967. So like this is the civil rights era. And like on one mm-hmm. on on one hand, I I think I can I can at least I, I I don't understand the black experience, but I can sympathize with a black man who wants who doesn't want to be perceived as black in the 1960s. But yeah. at the same time, he is he is trying to achieve like being perceived for his his talents as opposed to his skin color by disavowing the civil rights movement, basically. Roy Cohn did the same thing. I feel like there's going to be a lot exactly. of exactly very similar. Yeah. I think they had similar personalities too, like big personalities. And I really think that OJ was in many ways successful in his endeavor to transcend race. I I really don't think that like a lot of white America saw him first as a black man because he projected this very like American pie, like wholesome kind of persona. And because again, he made a point of not speaking on any of the civil rights movement uh, going on in the, in the wider country and also like the stuff going on like blocks away from USC where we're, he was becoming a star in football. And the documentary OJ Made in America is specifically focused on that, like the racial okay. politics and zeitgeist that surrounded the OJ murder trial in 1995. And in the first couple of episodes, they do this like amazing job of like juxtaposing all of this like footage of all the social unrest that's and political change that's going on in the wider country and specifically in Los Angeles at the time with you know these images of OJ playing football and all these like white people like specifically white guys like holding up signs for OJ and and job, okay. juxtaposing his like reluctance to speak on black issues when all of this stuff is going on in his backyard so USC is a private school it's not a state university it's not like ucla uh, or uc sb or anything like that it's it's a private university on this beautiful campus it's this absolutely stunning campus maybe one of the prettiest colleges i've ever seen and it is located in south la in a very like working class neighborhood it is like this incredibly wealthy privileged oasis in the middle of a very working class area and it's very close to a neighborhood called Watts, where which is still very working class and very black. And two years before OJ started attending USC, Watts is where LA saw one of the most violent uprisings incited by LAPD racist violence until the Rodney King riots in 1992. The Watts riots lasted six days uh, resulted in a bunch of deaths. It was something like 33 or 34 deaths. Jesus. Thousands of arrests. The National Guard was called. It was literally like a war. Like buildings were burnt to the ground. So like it's not like when OJ came to USC two years later, it's not like any of that was forgotten. Like yeah. it was still very much part of um, the – the history of the community that he was moving into. Um, So it's not like he didn't know that the Watts riots happened in 1965, you know? 1968, which was the year that OJ won the Heisman Trophy, uh, which is an annual award specifically for outstanding college football athletes, was the same year that sprinters Tommy Smith and John Carlos did the Black Power salute on the podium at the Summer Olympics. Have you seen this picture? It's a very it famous picture. I can you. I can send it to you. Yes, I have. So that was the same year he won the Heisman Trophy, and he was saying nothing about. Sorry, where was about this? the civil rights movement? Oh, where were they? What event the was this? Olymp- this is the Olympics. Oh, okay, um, gotcha. They were in Mexico that year. This okay. is the Summer Olympics. Um, so that was the um the track runners who won um, gold and bronze, uh, did the Black Power salute. A bunch of civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. were asking people to boycott the the Olympics, specifically mm-hmm. to draw attention to um, the plight of 
uh, black people in the U.S. where we're happy to send, you know, black athletes to represent us, but then we send our police to fire hose them and beat them and kill them. White America embraced OJ not just as a talented athlete, but as a talented athlete who wasn't also making them all feel guilty about how people who looked like Mm -hmm. him were being brutalized in the system daily. So on that note, should we take a little break for ads? Yeah, we definitely should. They love ads. They're probably like, where are the ads? Mm, Yeah. Speaking of the system, some ads. Let's get brutalized by some ads. (laughs) Jesus Christ. White America also embraced OJ for another reason, because he was movie star handsome. So can we talk about how hot he was? I want to talk about how hot he was now. Yeah, we have to you talk sent about me a this. photo. I sent you a Jesus photo where he, Christ. he looks like this the black and white Chad, the Chad meme. meme. It's the Chad yeah. meme. Like his jawline. Like what the fuck? His jawline. He's giving okay. like Thanos just a little bit. <laughs> It's it's a little bit too much jaw there, but it is taken from below. I'm gonna I send think, you a yeah, picture. I think it's the angle. It's the angle. I'm gonna send you a picture of him. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna send you a, a People article that has like a bunch of pictures of him that you can look at. Um, but I want you to specifically look at the fifth picture down, which is a picture of him when he was doing the TV show Roots. Jesus Christ! <laughs> that is disgustingly hot. He's like. Like he's it makes handsome. Sick how pretty he is. Like, he's handsome. Fuck? Like, and he's cl- also like the classically <sighs> handsome too. Yeah, like... he's handsome in this way where, like, while uh, especially like while he's talking as well, like he's got this like really amazing smile, and he's got a very friendly face. And honestly, like, I understand why all scary. the people. <laughs> yeah. But I understand why all the people who thought he was innocent thought he was innocent because you look at him and you're like, oh, but he's he's got like this sweet face. And he's so yeah. symmetrical. How could somebody this symmetrical be a liar? I don't think so. No. Uh, people who are hot never do bad things. It's only ugly people. I've never heard of it. <laughs> he's so, like, young OJ. Like, I think young OJ looked like he was, like, chiseled from marble by the masters. Like, yeah. But even, like, as he got older, like, at, at the end of that article, you can see, like, some pictures of him as he got older. And the last picture is actually just taken, like, a few weeks before he died. So he's, like, nearly 80 years old. And, like, I think he aged pretty well, especially considering how yeah. much he was, like, abusing his body in the two- 2000s and that he was, like, ravaged by cancer at the end. Like, black truly don't crack. It's true. The like man was handsome. The man was handsome. It's sick. I wonder if he got work done. Like a I little wonder, boat. Yeah. A little toxy. I just, wouldn't put it past him. Just to keep the line smooth. I could I could see it both ways. I could see him thinking that like getting any Botox would be gay and hating that. But I could also see him being like, well, this is my job to be handsome OJ. So yeah. I, see it going I live in a gay way. world. Yeah. Brushing your teeth is gay too, but I still do that. It is the gay agenda. They have <laughs> wokeness has taken over Hollywood. <laughs> So OJ's looks and charm not only made him a hit with, like, white America, but it made him a hit with the ladies. And, Mm -hmm. oh boy, was OJ a hit with the ladies. (sighs) So so OJ cheated on every single woman he had ever been with, uh, usually with multiple other women at a time. (laughs) Yeah? Yeah. And since, like, long before he was a household name. He also, he liked to make a game out of, (laughs) I would find this iconic if he was gay. He also liked to make a game out of stealing his friend's girlfriends just because he could. (laughs) (laughs) It's gay coded. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it is giving the L word actually. (laughs) And his first wife, Marguerite, who he married in 1967, uh, was one of those stolen girlfriends. Not Marguerite, a motherfucking Ornithal. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my Marguerite God. Marguerite is a nice name, though. Okay. I like Marguerite. No, I know. It's just together. It's it's too much. 
It is a little bit extravagant. Like, they are extravagant okay. names. It's one thing to have your friend steal your girlfriend, but then imagine he marries her too. Yeah. And I'm assuming at some point then also divorces her. Like then what the yeah. hell was the whole point? Like at least if they like stayed together forever, you could be like, well, I guess they were they were really in love. They were meant to be, yeah. And it's like, nope. No. <laughs> he was just bored. Yeah. He was just bored. He was and just super OJ. Hot. He's just super competitive. Like he was. I'm so attractive and bored right now. What should I do? Steal a girlfriend. It happens. After college, OJ was drafted by the Buffalo Bills and negotiated negotiated himself the largest contract in the history of sport at that point. Basically, while he was still at USC, he had gotten like a few minor roles in like TV shows and his acting career would definitely become like more of a focus as his football career started to draw to a close. So he threatened Ralph Wilson, the owner of the Buffalo bills that he would quit sports and like go become an actor. If Wilson didn't pay him $650,000 for a five-year contract, which is about $5.5 million in 2024 money. So like that, I mean, he did pretty good. Like a college age kid, like negotiating himself. He's yeah. like, pay me more than anybody's ever been paid before. Or because I got, because I got like a couple of speaking roles on Dragnet, I'm going to go become a famous actor. <laughs> Fucking watch me. <laughs> I, it took me a second after you said Buffalo Bills. And I was like, are they named after? The I know. That's why I started to land. laugh. That's I think so it's weird. the other way around. I think it's the other way around. Okay. <laughs> Like, well, that's a. I know Americans have like really strange and sometimes offensive mascots, but this one's very like niche <laughs> and uncomfy. Yeah. No, it makes me laugh every time I say it because <laughs> I, I just imagine that it's named after the character from the movie. <laughs> like the mascot, like running down the court, like, yeah. would you fuck me? <laughs> I mean, like, it's, really inappropriate. Just their mascot is a naked guy with his dick tucked between his legs. <laughs> oh, okay, that would horrible. be a little iconic. <laughs> like, yeah, I would really buy, would. <laughs> I would buy that jersey. <laughs> and and the Buffalo Bills is where he spends most of his football career. He uh, he did get traded to the San Francisco 49ers in his hometown for the 1978 season. Uh, But he spends most of his career just a running back for the Bills. And it's with the Bills that he famously became the first player to run a 2,000-yard season in 1973. Once again, you and I don't know or care about football, so I'm going to explain what this means. (laughs) Yards, similar to a meter. Who cares? Mm -hmm. So to this day, only seven other NFL running backs have managed to run a 2,000-yard season. And OJ is the only player in history to have done it in a 14-game season. All of the other running backs did it in a 16-game season. So basically, over the course of a season, he ran 2,000 yards, um, which is like was like impossible to do. Two extra whole games, yeah, to to add to do it. So again, well, they suck. He could fucking run, bro. Could run, and he was like maybe one of the best definitely one of the best running backs of all time if not the best running back of all time and maybe one of the greatest football players of all time he could play sports very well and as we get into the mid-1970s his acting career also started to pop off in 1974 he makes his film debut in a film called the Klansman, and he also appears in the towering inferno with paul newman and faye dunaway in 1975, he scores this endorsement deal with Hertz Rental Cars um, that ends up running through the 1990s. It was like super famous. They produced like this series of ads where he's like running through an airport, jumping over benches and stuff like like he's like he's doing sports stuff, but he's like dressed in a suit okay. and shit. And like all these like little white children and little white old ladies are like, go, OJ. <laughs> <laughs> And he's, like, running for his rent- rental car. Um, Run quite quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, in in Made in America, they interview some of the people who, like, worked on that ad campaign. And they specifically said that they never – showed like, the people cheering him on were never people of color. They were always white people because they wanted to project that a black man running through an airport was not a scary thing. 
it was a really fucked up time to be a black person. <laughs> and... I was about to say that like the need, <laughs> the need to do that is yeah. like still here, but yeah. I think it would be a lot more obvious what they were doing if they tried, yeah. <laughs> tried that in 2024. Where uh-huh. people would be like, we see you, like, quite clearly, but We thank know you. what you're doing. <laughs> and in 1977, he has a small show in the TV miniseries Roots, which is where I showed you that very sexy picture of him. Yeah. Roots. was Is Roots a big deal in Canada? It, it is a big it was, deal in yeah. the U.S. Yeah. yeah. It, it is a big deal in the U.S. 1977 was also the same year that he met a young blonde waitress named Nicole Brown. So should we take another break for ads before we talk about Nicole? let's not cut into her. Yeah. Mm I was like, I don't know that that was the best choice of words. That's okay. Oh. (laughs) Sometimes they say something on this podcast that's like, very intentionally provocative and sometimes they say something that's not and when i don't intend it i'm like no that's not okay but then i'll say something a hundred times worse on purpose yeah which makes it better well as long as there's intent to cause harm then it's fine Mm. yeah (laughs) you only want to be problematic in the first degree i never want to hurt anyone by accident by being careless (laughs) yeah (laughs) So, in June of 1977, O.J. Simpson is approaching his 30th birthday, which also means he's quickly approaching the end of his football career because football is not a career for people in their 30s. Right. He's also approaching the end of his marriage with his first wife, Marguerite. According to O.J., they'd basically been separated for quite some time, but but she somehow tricked him into getting her pregnant with their third child. <sighs> by a a thing that happens yeah she tricked him men famously uh usually need to be tricked into having sex Mm -hmm. and that's something that happens often what is this what are we doing (laughs) (sighs) so they end up having a third child a daughter named aaron Lashawn simpson who would be born in september of that year Uh, his two older children are a girl and a boy arnell and jason now very tragically, Erin Simpson would end up passing away just a, just a month shy of her second birthday after falling and drowning in the pool at OJ's estate at Rockingham. Damn. Yeah. Details about her death are kind of sparse. Um, I think OJ was like away playing football or like on a film set or something at the time. So he wasn't there. And he and Marguerite have like basically never talked about it publicly. It, it's straight like he... His estate at Rockingham was the place he lived, like, from the time he moved to L.A. for, you know, all of his life. Uh, He he just – oh, no, he moved to to Las Las Vegas after he got out of jail. But, like, until until he went to jail, he lived in Rockingham. And he would just fly to Buffalo for football. And I don't know. Like, obviously, I've never lost a child, and that's, like, the worst thing that could ever happen to you. He he references it in – in if I did it, he references Rockingham. Like I could, ne- I couldn't leave there. Like my kid died there. I would want to yeah. leave there if my kid died there. And it's, I don't know. Like it's interesting that he like almost never talks about it. In if I did it as well, he like skips over the part where his child dies. He just like quickly references it at, at one point in a in a sentence that was like about Rockingham. But he, it's like this horrible traumatic thing that happened to both of them and they never really talk about it Hmm. Hmm. i i would imagine that talking about it to the press is like not helpful in any way like they're not your fucking therapist i feel that for marguerite no good amount i don't know if i feel that for oj yeah (laughs) oj loves talking to the press (laughs) <laughs> and oj Maybe. also wants to make himself seem innocent and not culpable so i think it's for for nicole's death so it's like i mean if you had a thing that i it, it happened at the time that they met it didn't happen at the time that but i i just wonder like what kind of trauma that 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 he or if yeah. any that he had from that maybe he really didn't feel much about it it's possible yeah 
But we are in June of 1977. So in June of 1977, with a pregnant wife, estranged or no, and two kids at home, he goes out with some buddies for breakfast to a place called The Daisy, which was actually a Beverly Hills nightclub, but they had recently just started serving breakfast. And he lays eyes for the first time on a pretty 18-year-old blonde waitress there named Nicole. And how old is he right now? He's 29. He's a month shy of his 30th okay. birthday. And she's okay. 18 and five weeks. Mm. And according to his friends at the time, apparently he leaned over to the other men at the table and was like, I'm going to marry that girl. See, people say that all the time. That right. like, oh yeah, I leaned over and I said that. But I wonder like if maybe that's true. But he also said it about like every pretty girl he saw. So it's like, while well, it may be true just that this one time it, it was it, true. It, <laughs> it just like, it doesn't actually mean anything. I'm going to start doing that. What? You're going to start saying you're going to marry everybody? Yeah. Specifically girls as well. I'm going to marry that girl. <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see like like a hot daddy with like like walking his dog and be like, I'm going to marry that girl. I'm going to marry that girl. <laughs> We're going to get up. We're going to get on a bus and ride away together. <sighs> you see the West with him? <laughs> yeah. I do think like one one of the reasons – that everything happens the way that it did is because like he meets Nicole specifically at this time. He's like in a transitionary period where he's like starting to reach the end of his football career. And yeah. also she is very young. And what we see very often with these like 30 year old guys who like to date girls who are in their late teens and early twenties is they kind of want to shape them into um, into the into a person that they w want them to be. Like they're not obsessed yeah. with them. They just want like a project. Um, so like there's this like perfect storm of like when he meets her, how he meets her, uh, the age gap. Um, there's like he was abusive in his other relationships, but maybe not, and possibly even probably not to the same degree as he was to Nicole. But I feel like Nicole was someone that he wrapped so much more up into. Like mm -hmm. he, she was his new football, right? Well, um, like the game, right? Yeah. And when she, like when she, <laughs> not the object, like, no, no. <laughs> but maybe the object, <laughs> like she was his new like thing that like, and when she behaved with autonomy and, uh, and, and didn't like, um, wasn't what she, what he wanted her to be. Like he, he didn't know how to deal with that. So he reacted with a lot of emotion and violence. That's yeah. my theory anyway. When you said she was his new football, I pictured that like section of Castaway with Wilson. <laughs> like, She's his Wilson. She's his Wilson. She's really getting him through on that island. <laughs> Nicole Brown was originally from Germany. Her mom, Judy, was German and her father, Lou, was American. Eventually, they moved to California, to Orange County, and she graduated from high school at Dana Point High. Nicole, as an adult, was obviously known for her great beauty because she was fucking gorgeous. But as a kid, she was really known more for being, like, the sporty one in the family who always got, like, injured riding bikes and horseback riding and stuff. And she was, like, a California surfer girl and she, like, ran constantly. Like, she was an athlete in her own right. Her older sister, Denise, had a burgeoning modeling career. So when Nicole graduated from high school, she kind of went off with Denise for a bit and dabbled in modeling, but like it didn't really seem to take off for her for whatever reason. And she eventually got homesick. Um, so after a very short period, she returns to California and she moved into an apartment in Los Angeles with a photographer friend she met through the modeling world named David LeBron. In June of 1977, at age 18 years and five weeks, she meets O.J. Simpson while working the breakfast shift at the Daisy in Beverly Hills, and she has no fucking idea who he is. Yeah, that's, a, that's legitimately <laughs> iconic. I love it. The, okay, so this is a sidebar. Um, the podcast you're wrong about 
uh, has several episodes about the O.J. Simpson trial that I'm also cribbing from, from. And it's like all these episodes are like part of a series that that they've had ongoing for like years now and that I think they'll never actually finish. It's like the podcast version of the the Sagrada Familia or or like Disneyland or whatever. <laughs> It's really good. Everybody should listen to it. Um, They zero in on like lots of the small details in a way that other podcasts like this one can't. (laughs) Um, But a little accidental like running theme in the You're Wrong About series is almost every single man who meets OJ Simpson is like sickeningly fucking starstruck by him and like taken by him and they're like oh oj oh i loved you so much when you're playing with yeah. os with usc or with the bills and like just like like simping for simpson yeah. and every single woman who meets him is like who <laughs> and i love that i just think that's a little girl's rock moment he's so handsome is he? Who is he? Do you work here or? Yeah, he tips really well. What's he do? Is he like in tech? <laughs> I like how tech back then would be like <laughs> one of those birds that like sits on a thing a and like tips back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> my my complete inability to place like the technological advancements of humans yeah. over the past like three hundred years is like. A running joke, it's very but charming. also mostly accurate. <laughs> like, I'm like, 50 years ago, everything was powered by steam. <laughs> it's like the running joke of all these women not knowing who O.J. Simpson is. <laughs> Sometimes not knowing things is better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Like before you knew any of the things that we talked about on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, that my life was a little better. Yeah, especially my yeah. episodes. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Nicole doesn't know who OJ is when they meet, but he launches like a whole ass charm offensive on her. And he's like stopping by the Daisy several times a week and asking her out. So they go out on a date. Remember, pregnant wife at home. Pregnant motherfucking wife at home. Uh, So they go out on, uh, on a date. And when she gets home from her date, her roommate, David LeBron, I keep wanting to say LeBron. His name is LeBron. LeBron is a different person. Okay. Um, <laughs> so when she gets home from her date, her roommate, David LeBron, notices that the button of her pants is just ripped clean off. And Nicole is like, yeah, he was like a little rough and forceful. But I really like him. Okay. So... OJ and Nicole get together and very quickly he's like, well, I don't like that you're living with another man as your roommate. So, <laughs> Is he so gonna he get sets her, an her apartment? yeah, he sets her up with an apartment, which to be fair, when I dated a married oh man, he wasn't paying for my apartment. <laughs> yeah. So, like at some point it's time if you're going to, if you're yeah. going to have a kept woman that she gets kept like keep me i mean it is like put your money where your secrets are for the woman it is a game of like choose your own hell but i would rather have the hell yeah. where i don't have to spend money on rent every month so oj sets her up with an apartment because he doesn't want her to have a male roommate and it works out for him because he's still with marguerite at the time so like of now course. he's got like a place to go a nice place that he wants to be to go visit her He and Marguerite don't get divorced until March of 1979. So for a period of about two years, Nicole is the other woman. Yeah. This episode is going to hit so close to home for both of us for so many reasons. (laughs) (laughs) For a period of two years, two years, Nicole is the other woman. (laughs) Sometime after OJ and Marguerite are divorced, Nicole ends up moving out of the apartment and into Rockingham with OJ. And in total, their courtship period before marriage lasts for about seven years. So they're dating for, yeah, they date for a long ass time. After Nicole's death, a safety deposit box that she kept was opened by uh, the, the prosecution's team. 
and a bunch of pictures and letters to pictures of her and letters to OJ were inside, including this picture that I'm about to send you. I'm so sorry. Um, Oh no. Yeah. So this is a picture of her. She's got her hair in a towel um, and her left eye is, she has a black eye and it's like um, partially swollen shut. And it looks fresh. And based on the coloring. Yeah. And she looks very, very young in this picture. Mm -hmm. Like maybe still in her teens, maybe 2021. So kind of just based on how young she looks, we know that the abuse started very, very early in the relationship. The fact Uh, that she was cognizant enough to know that she needed to have a a photo for evidence. And she kept it in a safety but, deposit box because she knew she knew that she stayed. wouldn't survive. Yeah. It's it's hard to leave. Oh yeah, but I mean like there's for a lot of people there's like this extreme level of denial to the point where like you don't even let yourself think about it. But this is, like, so intelligent and so calculated, very intentional. The kind of thing that if you were watching this happen in a movie, you would be like, why don't they just do this? This is the, like, sensible, rational, objective thing to do. I mean, obviously, other than people screaming, like, just leave. But, like, that's fucked up. That's... Again, I have to go back to her age because she had five weeks of adulthood. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, maybe uh, however Adult long he was visiting the date. Word. Yeah, <laughs> however long he was like visiting the date Daisy, like um, before yeah. he actually moved her into an apartment. Like a few months, they were eighteen when he got together. So she was living in her dad's house, and then she was living in a house that OJ paid for. How do you leave? Like if and this is this is the reason like these abusive guys well, often I mean, go for can't. women who are that young because once you control every aspect of their life, even if you want to leave, you don't even know how to begin. So yeah, I think she was leaving breadcrumbs knowing that she would eventually die someday, mm-hmm. that it was very likely that she would die someday, um, but that she like had no other recourse she was just she knew she was doomed from the beginning um not that she didn't try you know uh, and we're going to talk about that but it's i think there might be some like a slightly more hopeful read um in that she was hoping eventually to be able to leave and this was her insurance right that in like a divorce or whatever that she would be able to say or like even to just be like you don't let me go I leak this to the like something like just to take her power back right to like because that's all you have in those moments like I'm not going to get like too into my own personal life history or anything but I had a notebook And I kept that notebook until he found it and threw it away. But I had pictures of it saved also on a CD that I kept in an Ani DeFranco case. Like, there's things that you do. There's, like, contingencies that you have. And, like, for me, it was, like, if I ever need this, I have this. Right. It wasn't like, oh, they're going to find this and they're going to know because, like, he's going to kill me or anything. It was very much like this is real this is happening i have logs of it and like yeah. that's the kind of thing that they ask for right because i'd i'd had friends go through this and they'd be like well you never said anything before and it's like well this has been happening for years and it's like well do you have even like even it written down on a a little piece of paper or something right. from that time or like anything and most people don't because you need to pretend it's not happening in order to continue mm-hmm. to live without being in like that constant state of like like abject terror you can't live like yeah. that like your body can't like actually process 
that yeah. level of like adrenaline running through you all the time. So like you forget, like you put right. it aside, you focus on other things. But the fact that she had that in there is like in a safety deposit box too. Yeah. You do need to remind yourself as well. Cause the, yeah. again, like getting I'm not making my this history, up. I like, I, I would forget like some of the worst things and then it would have to be someone like my mom who would be like, no, do you remember when you mentioned this? That had, so I, yeah. So maybe that, some of this was a, for herself. That's a very relatable, like the friend being like, well, that actually makes sense. Cause remember this time. And it's like, and you're like, Oh no, I completely actually no. blocked that out of my mind. <laughs> yeah. I, I very much that. did it. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, maybe some of this was for herself. Like, who knows? I don't know if that makes it more or less sad if she had hope or if she didn't. Uh, Maybe both at the same time. But it's like, this is why we gave people a trigger warning for this episode because we're getting triggered. It's very, (laughs) which is very very triggering for other people. I think we always expect people to do the like smart thing the thing again that you would like scream when you're watching somebody in a movie like why don't you just do this why didn't you do this yeah you get to the end of it or like a suspense where you're like ah if i if that were me i would have just done all these things and that's not how it works it i didn't start making a log until like seven months in right like which and that's because somebody told me to yeah yeah I and think like, probably because I had been like, no, I didn't remember things. that actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I also smoke a lot of weed. Like I forget everything. It's not just but that. But trauma but makes you like, forget that you put things out of your no, mind. No, that's true. Um, and, and the like, um, the you're under this, like, because it's never just, and and it's, it's never just physical abuse. Um, and sometimes there isn't physical abuse. It's just emotional. Like the emotional abuse is the thing that's always present. And yeah. there is like this process of like gaslighting you. So you forget things because like you don't – you start to like not trust your own memory and your own mind. Um, you remember so it's their like, version of it, how they yeah. count it over and over again. And yeah. so like you need to keep like a documentation of something so that you have it, so that you remember um so that you think that you're like lucid and then yeah and i think this is why again like these these abusive guys like go after these like very very young women because like they can control people who don't have the resources to leave you know this doesn't look what year was this or what like a year range uh, really don't know. This was just like from her uh, lockbox. It's not dated because um, obviously you don't have metadata on like a yeah an analog picture. But she looks so young in it. Like she has to be. She looks really young. She has to be in her she, early twenties or teens. It doesn't look like she took it herself. No, it looks like someone took it for her. Probably so a one friend of her friends or somebody yeah. knew. Probably one and of her took friends. This um, and had to go get this developed. Yeah. Like there are so many people along the way, so many like moments. This is completely speculative, but like a lot of people have pointed out the fact that in this photo where she appears to be very young, she's also got like a lot of like defiance and anger and emotion in her eyes. And like in future photos of her, like paparazzi photos and stuff from the time that she's married, she's got this like a thousand yard stare. I, this is one of those things where I'm always scared that I'm like projecting or I'm like, yeah. I'm I'm misreading because this is like a, a, a yeah. real science in any way. The way people are like, oh yeah, like the <laughs> I think the one of the main reasons why I'm always hesitant to like engage in that kind of like speculation is just because turfs every single time they see a photo of a trans man, they're like, 
he's so dead but well they don't say he but i'm going to he's so dead behind the eyes he's so unhappy he looks miserable and i'm always like you don't know you like don't know. i would also <laughs> like you like we literally don't know like every single i've paused my videos on random frames and if you were to try and like <laughs> read something from it you could get a lot of very different things but i do I, all of that is to say I'm going to engage in pseudoscience and I see exactly what you're talking about in this photo because right. that's one of the first things I noticed. She looks defiant. Was, yeah. Can but then like in my head, I was like, well, no. Okay, good. Can you hear that ambulance? No. Oh my God, I love these mics. I'm so glad Me we too. upgraded from our garbage <laughs> Me mics. Too. Before Fuck I was you, recording Yeti. with like, I was recording with like a fucking can with a string on it. Like... <laughs> So um, thank you to our for... Patreon patrons who paid for this. I mean, Honestly, really, you paid for my credit card payments after I put it on my credit card, but oh, you, you over the course of several months. Probably, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say the tin can with a string would still be less tinny than the Blue Yeti. <laughs> like... For me, the Blue Yeti wasn't tinny. It just had this like on the oh, high end no. the entire time I was recording. It was terrible. So it appears that the abuse started very, very early in the relationship. Um, the cheating also started very, very early. And I just want to say, like, in my humble opinion, like, having a mistress is one thing. But when your mistress has understudies, like, then you're just being extravagant. Like, it's a bit much. It's too Everybody much. gets one. Yeah. You don't get, like... Having a mistress is... Out of, it's very French. It, yeah. And, I mean, it's almost monogamy. It's classical monogamy. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, people are like, I'm, it is I'm a classical monogamy. liberal or whatever. Like, no, this is a classical... <laughs> classical mon monogamy. Yeah, I almost said misogyny. Yeah. <laughs> We must return. <laughs> Everyone gets one lover on yeah. top of their spouse. Uh, like uh, anything more than one extra, and like I'm sorry, you have to, you have to start. Polyamorous yeah, people stay out of this no, conversation. It's not about anything you. more than one, and you have to go poly, and you need to start being honest with people. Yeah, be honest. Yeah. You can't be lying to that many no. people. OJ is. Such a bad cheater in his relationship with Nicole. Like that poor he at it? Like kind of. He didn't hide it well he's, kind of thing or? No. And sometimes he would like not hide it on purpose. Like he would just like flagrantly do shit in front shit. of her. Yeah. Because he could. But God forbid if she ever. The, one of their like big first like huge arguments was because like she was like watching him at a football game and she kissed one of their mutual male friends on the cheek and he fucking let her have it for that meanwhile he he'll like bring his girlfriends to like outside their house because he doesn't view her as a person no. she is his property so he drives Nicole a little crazy too and a bit obsessive and at one point she has like a list of the license plate numbers of the women that OJ is sleeping with so that she can know if one of their cars is like in the neighborhood outside of their fucking house how do we know that she was which is an insane that? thing but also totally rational <laughs> I I think she she literally had like a list and we found the list mm-hmm I'm like, sorry, I'm so true crime pilled from like years ago when I used to listen. I was like, maybe that was like evidence too that like, what if something happened to one of these girls? She could be like, no, that's what if something that, did happen to that's one of those girls? OJ's. That's one of that's one of OJ's girlfriends. Girls. Yeah, yeah. I don't think she was thinking of it like that. I think she was like, I need to know when one of these bitches is near my house. <laughs> Fair. I feel like if I was gonna like live in like such a shitty life like that i would definitely yeah for so many reasons want to scare the other girls away 
Yeah. And I mean, this kind of stuff is you and, and the fact that like the people that knew them as a couple were like, well, you know, sometimes she would slap him back or she would push his buttons. Like so like a lot of people were like, well, it was like a mutual thing. And it's like, no, when you're in an abusive relationship, you will act out yeah. like you won't just take the abuse. And again, he started dating her when he when she was fucking 18 years old. Yeah. Like, sorry. She's acting like a dumb teenager. Well, maybe you shouldn't have started dating her when she was a dumb teenager. Like, maybe you should have, like, let her go live her life. I also, like, I don't know. I don't necessarily like it's victim this blaming. train, this, like, train of thought or, like, the necessarily, like, every logical implication from this. But right. she was also, like, tall and big and she was a yeah. little lady that's not to say that like slapping him is okay in any way but there was like for no. him at no point like any real like fear he Danger. controlled her entire life like him giving her black eyes and then her slapping him occasionally are just like disproportionate yeah. things like this is not Nicole could give as good yeah, as she could exactly. get no she couldn't she literally couldn't. She physically couldn't. Yeah. Slapping him is not okay, but I like I have no fucking sympathy for this like victim blamey argument no. where like, oh, well, sometimes she'd slap him in an argument. If she was or, the like, only one doing that, she would push it would his be buttons. a very different situation. Yeah. But like the the She's fighting yeah. back. She's doing literally what OJ taught her to do. Because she was a teenager yeah. when they started dating. <sighs> and OJ would do like the typical piece of shit rich guy thing where every time they got into a fight because he cheated on her, he'd buy her some exp expensive gift like jewelry or a car yeah. to try to make the problem go away. So he also had this habit of like every time they were having a fight, breaking all of Nicole's framed Jesus pictures Christ. of family and like throwing them out the window. That's and that was so common. So specifically <laughs> like, like he's like, you know, that thing abusive people do to their partners where they distance them from their breaking family pictures. and they like, they, they keep you away from everyone that you love. I'm going to do that. But like, not metaphorically. <laughs> <laughs> or like I'm gonna I'm gonna do that yeah. that wide range. This isn't thing. a TV movie. Yeah, I'm literally just gonna like <laughs> do that to their like a, like every actual image and representation yeah. of them that you have in the home <laughs> of like, our family. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it became so normalized that it was like an inside joke in the family. Like rather than being like, oh, are they fighting again? They would be like, oh, is my picture out on the lawn? Number one, I would I yeah. would one hundred percent stop buying like frames with glass. Framed pictures. Yeah. She would have to go reframe the yeah. pictures every time they got into a fight. Yeah. That's expensive. That adds up. Like even if you are rich, framing pictures is so I know. expensive. Get plexiglass. Why? Why is it so expensive? Uh, okay. This is why is it so I've expensive been, to get framed pictures? This and posters? is one hundred percent the thing. Do, I don't know if this was something that made it to the States. But, like, all the grocery chains in Canada were working amongst themselves to inflate the prices specifically of bread. <gasps> and, like, agreeing that... A conspiracy. The, yeah, like, and they were caught. And there was, like, class actions and stuff. Um, oh, my God. But I think the framing business is 100% doing this, too. Like, no oh, question 1, about 000%. it. They're like, it's hilarious. It costs us $3 to make one of these frames. And it's like $700 yeah, there was, if you were to get it done. There was no reason <laughs> a framed picture should cost that much. There's no way glass is that expensive. I'm uh, sorry. I could get prescription glasses no. for cheaper. <laughs> even, even if you get, like, a poster framed with, like, the plastic instead of the glass. Like, it's so much money. And it's like, why? Why? <laughs> They're all in standardized size sizes. Like, Why? it's not they're even so like you standard. have to make something special. <laughs> yeah, they're standardized. I'm asking for what nothing is here. the problem? It takes zero work. There's like no labor. I do the labor. <laughs> I have I to put frame the picture it. in a frame. 
<laughs> Hi, Angus. I'm so angry over framed photos as well. I'll never have a framed photo of you, Angus. I'll bring one. Like I'd like, I'd like to. Like I'd like to. To make my cats jealous. I'll bring one. I'll be like, look at that. Do you see that, Holly and Goblin? <laughs> this is a good boy. This is what a good boy looks like. <laughs> Now get back in your cage. <laughs> also known as your studio apartment. <laughs> what do you think I keep this door closed with the cats on the other side? <laughs> your landlord saying the same thing about you in your studio apartment. <laughs> like... Why do you keep why do you think we keep this door closed with hoots on the other side? <laughs> this is what a good girl looks like. <laughs> this is what a good girl looks like. Okay, that's Not amazing me. merch. <laughs> This is what a good girl looks it's like. It's like those shirts that say this is what a feminist looks like, but way less feminist. <laughs> <laughs> Selling them next to I do it for my daddy yeah. shirts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> With a photo of OJ. <laughs> that Roots photo, though. Actually, can we have I do it for my daddy shirts? Do we have a photo yes. of... OJ's dad. Dale Earnhardt. Okay. In drag. <gasps> Jimmy. We could find one. I don't know if we could find one in drag, but we could definitely find a photo of his dad. Okay, because that would be an iconic shirt. Because he's not a murderer. He just left his horrible son, which like sometimes yeah. hindsight is justification. That old quote. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> hindsight is 2020 and uh now sight is like 3020. <laughs> Wait, no. Which is, what's the bad one? 2030? Yes. 10. 6. Okay, are we just saying four? Are we just saying numbers now? <laughs> are we just saying numbers now? <laughs> okay, but Nicole and OJ, I mean, the reason that they were together for so long and the reason, like, all this, like, toxic shit was normalized is because they had that, like, stereotypical toxic relationship where when things were good – they were so good. Like, they genuinely were very much in love. The most in love that a man like OJ, I think, can be with someone. I don't know how many times in this episode I'm going to say this, but I don't know if that makes it better or worse. Yeah. I mean, I think, I don't think it does either. No. I think it just explains why she stayed. And why even after she left for a period of time, she kind of went back. I think I'm just like desperately searching for things to make me feel better about this. But then like whenever I find one where I'm like, well, at least she was in love. I'm like, is that worse? <laughs> and then I, I have that little internal moment yeah. where I'm like, oh, so it's there's just no making any of this any better. So this story is like the American tragedy for white guys in wraparound sunglasses who think that like being a sports star and falling from grace for killing your wife is like a tragedy. But it's <laughs> it's also an American tragedy for like sweet, simple bitches like us who like shitty men. And we're like, you just see it and you're like, I know it's bad. And I know why she stayed. Yeah. I know why she, every time she got away, she was like, this is it. Like, this is, I'm, I'm free now. And then a few months would go by and she would miss that drug. <sighs> how many, I don't know if we're going to get into this, but how many times did she, did she go that you know of? Like, was it like once or was this constant? There was like one big time, um, like they they did get divorced eventually right it's it's hard to say like how many times like she tried to leave while they were still dating like before they got married mm -hmm. because some of these details we just like don't don't know the relationship was turbulent from the start she complained about the cheating a lot to her friends from the start like that was like her real bugbear at the beginning uh, I I don't think it was until much later on that she started to tell people about the abuse and she started right. to write down and document the abuse until af I think after their divorce was when she actually started to like try to keep a timeline of things but the cheating in particular like really she was just like I don't 
I don't know why he keeps doing this to us. So there's there's like this love connection, but also in addition to paying for her apartment while she lived alone before she moved to Rockingham, OJ, OJ set her dad up with a Hertz dealership and he put her younger sister through college. So they're also like incredibly financially entwi- intertwined. And like, okay, now this is, again, just my speculation. You can read two things into that. Either OJ is like this manipulative, like, cal- I, I mean, I think either way he's manipulative, but like either he's like incredibly calculating and is like trying to like keep her through like financial domination. Or, and this is what I kind of think, Everyone who knew OJ said that he was just he was just a generous guy. Um, and I, I personally think that some of this comes from growing up poor and suddenly becoming very wealthy. It's like you want to give things to the people around you. What that turns into if you are immature and kind of subconsciously manipulative is this like having financial dominance over the people in your immediate circle because you have the power to give and take things. So that's my theory is like that it wasn't so much like a premeditated calculated like, oh, I'll give her dad a Hertz dealership and then she won't leave me. I think it was just like when OJ is feeling generous, he gives things to the people around him. But then if you fuck with him, that generosity can come to an end. Yeah. Um, So this is another reason why it was like very difficult for her to leave because she would start to feel like she wanted to maybe break up with him or get a divorce. And then the people in her family even would be would talk her out of it, A, because they were like, you love each other so much and B, because we need him. Yeah. Like he is he is the breadwinner. Nicole really, really wanted to get married um, and have children. I really identify with Nicole. <laughs> Nicole really wanted to get married and have children. And she also, like, some, while they were dating, somehow convinced herself that OJ, OJ's cheating would end if they were officially married. Okay. She, I think this is a cope. I think this was a, mm-hmm. well, if, if there's paperwork, he will stop doing it. He's only doing it because we're not really official. Um, yeah. And I could see how you could convince yourself of that because there totally. is there is like another thing where you could be like, well, we're just not there yet. Yeah. There's like something cope. you can point to mm-hmm. that you can use uh, to like ease your your anxiety and like yeah. to convince yourself that things are going to be different at some point. That's really sad, though. Yeah. We need the seriousness of the covet covenant of marriage and yeah. then he'll stop. So I mentioned that I read If I Did It for for this, for the research for this, which was like the biggest waste of time I'm of sorry. my life. It wasn't <laughs> well, even it's upsetting. It's not like a reliable narrator <laughs> yeah. or anything. Like, just shut up. Yeah. I expected to be upset by it, but I was just like annoyed and bored because he's like not even a good unreliable narrator. It is just a book about like, I mean, he he cloaks it in like it's if I did it. He cloaks it in like, well, this didn't. These two chapters didn't happen, but if they did, this is how they would go down. Well, I didn't do it, but if I did, like, listen, the rest of it is about how Nicole was such a bitch. She was a bitch, 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 and she was nagging him all the time. And like, even if I did do it, like, would you really blame me? Because she's such a bitch. It was like the biggest waste of time of my life. This is how I felt with. Graham, Graham. <laughs> yeah yeah where i'm just like all you're doing is saying how nothing is actually your fault everyone's always horrible to you and you're such a like kind generous person who's always looking out for others and like just shut the fuck up oh my god like, <laughs> yeah the actual book if i did it wasn't the good part the good part where like in in the audiobook that I listened to, because I did do the audiobook, I, I was not going to sit and look at the page for this. There was like an intro from Ron Goldman's sister, and there was an outro from a journalist who worked on the case whose daughter had been murdered by her intimate partner. Um, and those were the good parts of the book. The like prologue and the epilogue that they added like <laughs> after the publication of the book for like the 20th anniversary edition or whatever um 
Like the the meat of the book Holy itself. Shit, the books have, sucked. The book's been out that long. I don't think it's the twenty. Or the, I, actually, I think the book came out in two thousand seven. Oh, so we're close. So it's, yeah, yeah, we're getting close. So not Jesus. 20th, maybe tenth anniversary. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the actual book itself sucked, and I <laughs> like an unreliable narrator. Like that's not why it sucked. Like that, I wanted to listen to it because I wanted to hear like yeah. an unreliable narrator tell me his version of the story. But it's just so boring. It is like so much of it is just like wives. Am I right? They suck. The old ball and chain. Oh, God. Uh, who are you writing for? People Ugh. who play golf? Boomers. Yeah. Boomers who play golf. Ew. But in If I Did It, he describes Nicole as constantly nagging him about marriage for years like a bitch. She's like, meh, meh, meh. I want to get married. Blah, blah, blah. And like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like a hey, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that's women be like me 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 i want to get married me 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 and it's like <sighs> dude weren't you the guy who like laid eyes on her when she was a teenager and you were like that's my wife i'm gonna marry her <laughs> like then do it you piece of shit like fuck you he's like oh i'm gonna marry that woman eventually after a really unnecessarily long dating yeah. period that's not good for either of us but especially for her and I'm going to be gonna really annoyed about, about it. About it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fuck you. Fuck you. <sighs> anyway, it does seem that at least for a few years while they're dating, like OJ isn't in a hurry to get remarried, even though he said that at the start. And Nicole really wants it because apparently that's like what all the people around them said is like Nicole was like, I want to get married. I want to have children. And OJ yep. was like, well, I, I just got divorced, so I'm taking my time. When OJ finally does ask her to marry him, it's after a fight because she caught him embracing one of his other girlfriends as she was driving around the neighborhood. Like, Nicole is, like, fucking driving home, and he's, like, standing outside <laughs> hugging his girlfriend. And she's like, fuck this. Fuck you. I'm leaving. And he apologizes to her, and his apology is basically like, will you marry me? Let's go shop for a rock. And she says yes. the way I was like, will you marry me? And I'm like, no. It's like, let's go shop for a rock. And it's like, I do love rings. <laughs> yeah. Should we take another ad break? Let's go get you some jewelry. Yeah. Um. Let's see if this works. We want an ad for jewelry. Jewelry Jewelry, ad. rings, diamonds. Cartier, Tiffany. Beyonce. Pandora. <laughs> Beyonce. <laughs> Are we just saying fancy things now? Blue Ivy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ads. Last time the dom a lot of people got dominoes ads because we never do that's right because we were talking, talking about, about we we're talking about how dominoes is poor people food <laughs> for hungover brown haired bitches <laughs> who live in apartments <laughs> so oj and nicole get married in february of 1985 and their daughter sydney is born in october of that year and their son justin is born in 1988 I do want to include like one little picture of their wedding um, just because Nicole looks so happy in it and so many of the pictures of her, she does not look happy. So it's just like really yeah. sweet to see this picture of her looking overjoyed. He's like taking her garter off at the reception and she just looks like so like she's laughing and she's beaming. She's so pretty. No, she's like fucking yucking it up. She's she's like laughing. Best fucking time. Yeah. Yeah. It's so sweet. She's I living. Just, I love it. I love it. I really hope she's that she living. had a good wedding. We don't know, you know, we don't know what was going on in her head at the time, but I really hope that even though her marriage was a was a nightmare, um, I hope that she had a happy wedding. Well, especially if she thought that like this was gonna be that 
the thing that made that change. Yeah, she had so much at hope. Least a good day. Yeah, hope for the future. I think he started cheating on her like the next day or whatever. <laughs> of course, I would expect literally nothing else on this podcast. Yeah. If you told me she caught him, like in at the, the wedding, with someone at the yeah. wedding, I the would have, I would not have yeah. been. I would not have been surprised. It would whatsoever. make sense. It would yeah. make sense. In If I Did It, OJ describes how he didn't care how Nicole looked, but the idea of gaining weight <laughs> during pregnancy drove her insane, and she was being such a bitch because she put on pregnancy weight. The idea that this man is claiming, like, I don't care how she looked, and it's like, then why did you find, like, a skinny, beautiful, blonde 17-year-old? Yeah. <laughs> You just like he, I don't care how she looked as long as she you know <laughs> looks like that. I fell in love with her at first sight for her brain. <laughs> I could see her thoughts. Uh, so <laughs> I'm gonna marry that mind. <laughs> I'm gonna marry that. She seems so intelligent. <laughs> that sounds mean. That came out sounding like I don't think she is. I think she was very intelligent. No, um, you just can't see that by. But you can't see that right away. <laughs> you don't whatever. go. I'm gonna marry that 18 year old because you think she's yeah. got a brain. <laughs> uh, so his story is he's like, she's my wife, and that's my baby. I don't care how fat she gets. Uh, however, uh, he's so in <laughs> a letter Nicole left in the safety deposit box with the pictures of her bruised face. Um, Nicole's story is a little bit different. I and actually, I, I think she's uh, I think she's intelligent because I'm going to read you some of her writing and like she's she's like pretty good with words. You wanted a baby, so you said, and I wanted a baby. Then with each pound you were terrible. You gave me dirty looks, looks of disgust, said mean things to me at times about my appearance, walked out on me and lied to me. I remember one day my mom said, he actually thinks you can have a baby and not get fat. I gained 10 to 15 pounds, more than I should have with Sydney. Well, that's by the book. Most women gain twice that. It's not like it was that much, but you made me feel so ugly. I've battled 10 pounds up and down the scale since I was 15. It was no more extra weight than was normal for me to be up. I believe my mom. You thought a baby weighs seven pounds and the woman should gain seven pounds. I'd like to finally tell you that that's not the way it is. And had you read those books I got you on pregnancy, you might have known that. Talk about feeling alone. In between Sydney and Justin, you say my clothes bothered you, that my shoes were on the floor, that I bugged you. Wow, that's so terrible. I had low self-esteem because since we got married, I felt like the paragraph above. There was also that time before Justin and a few months after Sydney. I felt really good about how I got back into shape and we made out. You beat the holy hell out of me and we lied at the x-ray lab and said I fell off my bike. Remember? Great for my self-esteem. That time that she's referencing at the end, she had a broken arm because he beat her. And they lied and said that she fell off of her bike. And most of this is over the way he felt she looked during pregnancy. She gained 10 pounds. She gained 10 that pounds. That is That's like nothing. an unhealthy pregnancy. Yeah. Like. I could gain 10 pounds and and lose it again, like, over the next couple of months just by, like, eating more. Yeah. Like, not even getting pregnant. Like. Yeah. 10 pounds is not that much. She says, I don't know how tall she was as well. I, I think she was a bit taller than me. So like 10 pounds is like nothing. She did just gain the baby, but he thought a baby That's should so only be up. seven pounds. He would have said something about that too. Yeah. Mm. 100%. There is no way at which he would have been happy. He just wanted something to bully her about. Yeah. Nicole Brown Simpson also left behind a diary. Um, I can't remember if this was found in the safety deposit box or if with if it was with her other possessions, but um, in the diary, she made a timeline of the abuse. Um, so this was probably written towards the end there, because um, we'll get to this, but she gets more frightened towards the end, towards the end of her life. Um, so she probably made this timeline uh, later on. One of the entries says, 1978, First time he beat me up after Lewis and Nunny Mary anniversary party. Started on a street corner of NYC, 5th Avenue at about C. Threw me on the floor and hit me. Kicked me. 
We went to Sherry Netherland Hotel where he continued to beat me for hours as I kept crawling for the door. Called my mother a whore. Hit me while he fucked me. Other alleged instances of abuse include locking her in a wine cellar overnight for embarrassing him in front of people and locking her out of a hotel room in nothing but her underwear. There was one instance where OJ told some of Nicole's friends that she couldn't come downstairs and meet them because she wasn't feeling well, and she later told them that it was because she'd run out of makeup to cover the bruises. And there was even one time that she ended up missing a friend's wedding, blaming bad period cramps, but she later said the real reason was because her face was so bruised and swollen she couldn't be in public. So Nicole made several 911 calls over the course of their relationship. In 1985, police responded to a 911 call Nicole made because OJ was beating her car with a baseball bat. The LAPD officer who responds to this dispute is a guy called Mark Furman, um, who is significant um, because Mark Furman had a history of being like very racist. Uh, race is a big is a big part of a big theme in this story. Uh, Mark Furman was a racist LAPD cop. Um, he would say racist things. He would use racial, racial epithets. And he, the, def- the defense in the eventual murder case would place a lot of emphasis on the fact that Mark yeah. Furman responded to this call in 1985 um, because they were, they essentially made the case that like Mark Furman saw this black man with a white wife and he was so incensed that nine years later he placed he placed the glove and framed OJ at the scene of the crime. Yeah. Um, not nine years later, uh, four years later. Um, no, I can't do math. Nine years later. Nine and years we later. shouldn't be expected to. We shouldn't be expected to. Nine years later that he would place the glove at, at the scene of the crime. However, uh, so like that Mark Furman was racist is true. And that like Mark Furman was not a good cop and, and probably people went to jail uh, because he was racist is 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 a true statement. Uh, back in 1985, Furman actually didn't seem to be like too moved by the altercation between Nicole and OJ. Like mm-hmm. people forget that like people who are racist often are also misogynist. <laughs> um, and like so, he basically goes up to Nicole and he's like, "What's going on?" And um, she says that like. He, her husband is being abusive and like beating her car with a bat. And technically it's OJ's car because he owns everything. So like Furman is like, well, technically it's his car. He can do whatever the fuck he wants with it. Do you want to press charges for abuse? And she was like, no. And he was like, well then it's your life. And he leaves. So it doesn't seem that he actually was too moved by Nicole's plight. And the only reason he remembered that, Uh, visit after the fact was because oj was a celebrity like he knew who oj was from tv and movies and from his football career so i don't think that Furman perceived him to be a black man and i mean and even if he did like he may have easily just been like well you got yourself into the situation like which is what they often say and also yeah like LAPD, an LAPD person, like like a, a cop responding to a domestic dispute is like, well, beating your wife is just like something that happens in relationships. Like 40% yeah. of us do it. It's fine. Yeah, we did a poll <laughs> I, at the station. <laughs> Who am I to bring OJ in for something that isn't a crime? Yeah. If it was a crime, we'd all be in jail. It's like, yeah. Well, <laughs> who would arrest you? The big incident that everyone knows about um and the only instance of domestic violence that oj ever actually admitted to came on new year's eve of 1989 is it because he did it in public and people saw Mm -hmm. yeah well no it's because he actually suffered consequences this time um so near the end of december in 1989 the simpsons had taken a family trip to hawaii and apparently Out at the bar one night, Nicole starts talking to this gay couple. And remember, OJ's a homophobe. Um, So the story changes depending on, like, who's telling it, like, whether it's a friend of OJ's or, like, a friend of Nicole's or, like, a member of Nicole's family. 
Uh, but OJ's friends say that like one of the guys in this couple was dying of AIDS and he was covered in lesions and Nicole uh, let him kiss their son Justin and and OJ was outraged because he didn't want his son Justin to get AIDS. Nicole's sister Denise was like, no, she was just talking to a gay couple and the baby yeah. was there. The baby happened to be there. Either way, OJ ends up like grabbing the baby away and like screaming at Nicole. They get into this fight that lasts for days. Um, and for context around this fight, so this is 1989, OJ cheats on Nicole without wearing a condom and refuses to get tested. Um, and it's 1989. So Nicole is constantly, like at this point in time, is refusing him sex. Their son, Justin, was born in 88. She's refusing him sex because she's really terrified that he is going to give her AIDS. Um, yeah. Because he refuses to get tested while he's cheating on her with a bunch of people. And so, like, that's, like, the background conversation. Like, the the context of this argument that they're having is, like, well, you let my son be in, you know, breathing distance of a gay person. So they get into this argument that lasts for days. Um, they fly back to California. And on New Year's Eve, they both have a few drinks um, because it's it's New Year's Eve. Um, yeah. And he tries to make her give him a blowjob and she refuses. And he starts what he describes as a mutual res wrestling match because she refused to give him sex. So he starts... Like, to me, that that reads more like attempted rape yeah. and spousal abuse because, like, a mutual ref wrestling match is not a real thing unless you're actually wrestling in a, in a ring. Yeah. <laughs> like. Also, I don't know if you've, like, I don't know if anyone's ever seen a wrestling match, but they don't normally pair, like, a small woman and a giant, giant man. Yeah. Yeah. And usually there's people watching it and it's not. Mm -hmm. In a hotel room and directly and like, after someone says no. Below jobs don't factor into the ring at all. That's for after. <laughs> at least in the wrestling I've seen. <laughs> yeah, but that's just us though. That's just us. That's that's the <laughs> wrestling that we know. It's like <laughs> So he beats the shit out of her and she calls 911. And uh when the operator answers the phone, Nicole the the only thing the operator hears is screaming. Like, Nicole is not actually able to get to the phone. She manages to dial and, like, like a horror movie, leaves it yeah. hanging off of the receiver. Um, and all they hear is her screams. So they send cops. And when the cops arrive, again, like a scary movie, Nicole runs out of the bushes. She's wearing nothing but a bra and a pair of sweatpants that are caked in mud. And she's screaming, he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. And the cops are like, who? And she's like, OJ. And I mean, this 911 call exists. You can go listen to it if you fucking hate yourself. No. Um, yeah, I'm not playing any 911 calls for you. No, that's uh, not how this is happening. But she, like, in it, you can, you can also hear her frustration. Actually, no, this is a future one. There's a future one that you can hear her frustration um, where she tells the – this is a future one where she can actually talk because she's not actively being beaten, but he's beating the door down. She's called the cops on him so many times. And she's like, you know who he is. He has a record. I got confused because this is not on the 911 call. This is what she says to police. She's like, you've been down here so many times and you don't do anything. And they're like, well, do you want us to arrest him? And she was like, yes. So this is why this is the only one that he admits yeah. to because there is a record. <sighs> okay, I'm not going to show you a 911. I'm not going to play a 911 call for you, but I do have to send you um, this picture because her injuries were documented. They put a sweater on her when they first arrived because she, she was wearing, she was literally wearing nothing but a bra and sweatpants. like Because she ran out of the room. Because she ran out of the room while he was trying to rape her. Yeah, a wrestling match where you're covered in bruises and... And cuts. And cuts all over your face, yeah. And um, I couldn't find these online, but OJ Made in America also shows her at the um, police station when she's filing her report. 
and she's wearing the sweatpants and they are yeah they are just caked down one side with mud i i think she must have like jumped out of a window or something and landed on her side because she's just like covered in mud so oj was told he was being placed under arrest and he was like okay well i'm gonna go upstairs to put some clothes on and then he got into his bentley and fled the scene (laughs) 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 the thing that i'm laughing at is cops are so fucking stupid and useless like nobody goes with him (laughs) and they don't do anything about it (laughs) they just watch him tear away they're like they're like oh yeah no yeah no i think you're right tim that's him that's definitely him sir come back (laughs) sorry ma'am we did everything we could he doesn't get he doesn't get in trouble for resisting arrest. Like he doesn't get any charges for resisting arrest for literally running away as well. I think that's like <laughs> different than resisting arrest. I think that's <laughs> like a whole other like fleeing the fleeing scene of a crime, crime scene. <laughs> yeah, and like <laughs> like I feel like resisting is when you're like no uh, no and that <laughs> when hurts. you like get in your car and drive Stop away. <laughs> Daddy, <laughs> ciao. Yeah, I told you that the safe word is pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, <laughs> that's wild. Getting in your car and bi- being like bye pigs. <laughs> Just being like, hang on, I'm gonna go put on a sweater. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> getting in his little car and driving away but it like it's obviously little because he's huge so it's like <laughs> <laughs> his little bentley <laughs> like <laughs> choosing the bentley when you have the bronco i feel like that is really camp too because he has the yeah well, he might not have the Bronco at this point. I don't know. I yeah. know he has cheaper cars around, but he's like specifically my getaway car is my Bentley, which is well, very funny. I mean. It's Met Gala <laughs> camp. <laughs> oh, fuck. I what love piece it. piece of shit. <laughs> he sucks so much. But he does do funny <laughs> things like this where I'm like, I have to respect the comedy. Like, I. <laughs> well, there's there's like hijinks to running away from the yeah. police. He's a shit like poster. That- that, like, <laughs> I'm it's sorry, funny. but anyone who evades the police, like, <laughs> by it is kind of like iconic. such an easy like misdirection. <laughs> Look over there! Like, ho- it's OJ Simpson. <laughs> Getting in your car. <laughs> <laughs> Not them coming up to him and being like, "You're under arrest," and he's like, "He's getting away." <laughs> and they run off in the other direction. <laughs> I picture all cops <laughs> as like Barney Fife characters or whatever the fuck, but like they're so much worse because they're both yeah. like way more evil and way more inept. Yeah, the worst like, guy they, they from could your do something and they just don't. No, like... yeah, <laughs> the worst, laziest, most aggressive guy, aggressive and lazy, which is like a, a deadly combination. <sighs> aggressive, guy... lazy, like aggressively lazy and yeah. lazily aggressive. Like it's lazily like... aggressive, yeah. That guy from like your algebra two class in high school, like that oh, is the guy who becomes a cop. And he's yeah. And you always know when he's frustrated because you hear like something being like slammed, and it's like, bitch, yeah, you shouldn't be in algebra. And you don't need it if you want to become a cop. In fact, I'm pretty sure if they see on your like high <laughs> they school discourage transcript, <laughs> yeah, that you've taken like math above like a remedial level, they're like, mm, yeah, <laughs> I don't think you're they're like. Fit. Calculus? Mm, no. We actually don't like it when you have critical thinking skills because it's really bad for us using yeah. like our tactics to control you so that you can use those tactics to control others. We just don't see a future for you in this industry. <laughs> Why don't you go be a gender studies professor or something <laughs> where they use where they use their little brains? Women's work. OJ later pled no contest to spousal abuse, uh, but he would go on to say that he never actually hit her. Um, you saw those pictures. He was like, I never yeah. hit her. Uh, I grabbed her. I only, I picked her up. Yeah, I grabbed her. I picked her up because she That's was abuse. throwing our Tiffany lamps everywhere in our argument and breaking them, and I just wanted to control her. Yeah. That's... um. Given that he's like constantly breaking and like throwing pictures out the window, 
I feel like that doesn't hold up, sir. Well, this is the thing about If I Did It as well is like all of If I Did It, like 80% of it is him like saying things that he did and saying that like Nicole did them. He was like, she was like stalking me at one point and like all of their friends are like, oh yeah, OJ would like wait out in the bushes outside of Nicole's house after they got divorced. She so was everything. at one point. She kept showing up to work where she worked on the days that at the Buffalo I decided Bills. to come there after her. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, I made out I made her move out of that place with her roommate, Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill. <laughs> really strange guy. Has a weird thing with fat chicks. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> yeah, so every accusation is a confession from OJ. And yeah, he specifically mentions the Tiffany lamps and he's like I had to take care of the Tiffany lamps. So I I just like picked her up and was like trying to control her. And if she got scuffed up in that process, like it happened. He does this in the um there's it wasn't televised, but there is video footage of the civil trial after the murders. Um, and he does that in that as well. He's like, uh, yes, I take responsibility for hurting her. No, I never hit her because his line is like, I was just trying to It was like an incidental injury. Yeah. That was it was like, mutual wrestling. It was mutual wrestling. It was mutual wrestling where I picked her up and rendered her immobile. I was mutually you know. punching her in the face. <laughs> yeah. What happened to her fucking face then? <laughs> yeah. What happened to her fucking face? And also, like, squeezing someone like this doesn't leave a bruise under your arm. Like, he clearly had, like, yeah. grabbed her. Like, it's, like, also, very, like, it, like, looks like a fucking hand. Squeezing like, something like this? Also still abusive. I, um yeah. Also not me, but I had someone. a friend. Yeah. Can kill someone. I had a friend who, uh, with a boyfriend who would do that kind of thing. And I was like, oh, that's a weird thing to do in an argument and not safe. Yeah. So I mentioned how their lives were financially intertwined. And at this point in 1989, they had two children. After the event, Nicole called the president of Hertz and recanted her story to him because she was afraid that OJ would lose his endorsements. But the New Year's Eve incident does seem to be the beginning of the end for Nicole. Um, it would it would be a while longer before she start before she divorced him. But um, uh, it it seems to be like a huge turning point. She'd stay with him for another couple of years before filing for a divorce in 1992, following the discovery of his affair with actress Tawny Catan. So, Nicole. In 1992, is 33 years old and just experiencing adulthood for the very first time. Because, you know, she had, like, what, a couple of months of adulthood between, like, living in her dad's house and living in OJ's apartment yeah. and then house. And now she's, like, finally, like, I'm free. I'm free. And it was, like, her first adulthood wasn't even, like, real adulthood either. No. It was, like, when you're 18, you're not really an adulthood. adult. That's not, that's mm -hmm. nothing. I'm sure she was You're still calling old... mom and dad and being like, can you pay my yeah. rent for me? I'm too poor right yeah. now. She was like an elder teen. You're still a teen yeah. at 19. I'm sorry. but A hundred percent. You were a teenager. You're a baby. I was still yeah. a teen at 27. And now I'm <laughs> 21 at 35. Anyway, so she's like 33 years old. She's got a new lease on life. Um, in the she got like next to nothing in the divorce because they didn't have a prenup, but she did get like some alimony payments. They have a uh, they have uh, shared custody of their kids, and she got they had an apartment in San Francisco that I believe she sold in order to buy an apartment, a, a house rather, uh, kind of near OJ, so that you know, the kids don't have to be too far apart like right. when they're going back and forth. But she gets to be Nicole for the first time, like not O.J. Simpson's wife. Um, and the media really fucking attacked her for daring to go out to clubs with her girlfriends when she was fucking finally divorced. <sighs> and whenever she goes out to the club, in addition to the like media judging her, 
OJ or one of his friends would just like miraculously appear at the club that she was at and keep an eye on her. What a small town, Los Angeles. (laughs) (sighs) OJ also calls her constantly, like sometimes up to 20 times a day. And he starts showing up showing up outside of that house that she bought uninvited but in if i did it he's like nicole was kind of like stalking me for a while she wanted to be with me she was always watching me from inside her house through her window (laughs) (laughs) like i fucking hate this so much this is so triggering for us i know i'm like pulling my hair out (laughs) Don't don't touch your hair. <laughs> Pick at your nails. Do something else. <laughs> oh. <sighs> For the entire period they were divorced and with greater frequency in the months leading up to her actual death, Nicole would tell multiple friends and family members, OJ is going to kill me someday. OJ will kill me. Like, just as a, a matter of fact, OJ is going to murder me. She spent a lot of time skiing in Aspen, uh, sometimes with the kids uh, and sometimes uh, solo. And on one of those trips, she meets a dude called Kato Kalin. Amazing. So, yeah, this is this is going to get confusing because... I'm in. Uh, yeah, he's called Kato Kalin. My podcast co-host is called Kalin. But also the children, Nicole's children, loved Kato Kalen so much that they had a dog that they named Kato. So I think I have to refer to Kato Kalen as his full name the entire time. Because we've got a Kalen, Kalen a Kato, Kato and human. a Kato Kalen. <laughs> Adult Hu- Kato human. <laughs> hey, human Kato. Adult There's human Kato. Okay, how about... Specify if you're talking about a dog. I might be able to pick it up I from will. context clues. I'll say Kato the dog. Uh, I'll say Kato the dog. And I think oh. I think for this episode, we might be good because I don't think Kato the dog comes up until the next episode. But okay, well, there, can be there is Kato a... Kato and Kato the dog. Yeah. There's a Kato the dog. There's a Kalen the podcast co-host. <laughs> and then there's a Kato Kalen, the, the sweet dumb bitch. I love oh. Kato Kalen. He's a himbo. Oh, I love him. Do, I love him. Wait, do we have photos? We do. I'm going to show them to you in a, a few minutes. Okay. Okay. Because I'm going to – actually, I'll, I'll send them now. I'll send them now uh, while I'm describing like, him. So there's a man. And I'm like, okay. I'm waiting. Can we see him? I have my phone, Can we see I have my phone him? open. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to send this to you. And then I'm going to describe him while – I'm, I'm going to describe what he was like while we're yeah. looking at a picture of him. I hate every um, photo you've sent me in the last, like, hour. This is him at trial. This is him at the trial in an article. Oh, he is a himbo. He's he's the archetypical himbo. He's yeah. got lo- long blonde he hair. He's got like cronk. <laughs> super strong jawline, big lips, a little cleft chin. Like, so Kato Kalin yeah. was an aspiring actor who'd had a few bit parts and a leading role in a made-for-TV movie. And his relationship with Nicole seems to be completely platonic because when they met, she actually had a crush on like one of his friends named Grant that they met in Aspen. Um, but anyway, he's like, in addition to like looking like a himbo facially, he was also like really buff and he like worked out a lot. And Nicole has this situation where her ex-husband keeps, like, showing up and her – she has, like, this, like, back house in the house that she's bought and Kato's, like, an aspiring actor. So she was like, you know what? Why don't we do this? In exchange for you living around me for protection – she didn't didn't say this to him, but, like, she wanted him there for protection. Yeah. Why don't you come live in my guest house – and I will give you reduced rent if, like, when I want to go out with the girls, you, like, uh, babysit the kids. Yeah. And he was, like, done. Because the kids fucking love Kato Kalin. So they become, like, close friends and, like, I guess not roommates because he lived in her, like, back house. But, like, they yeah. live on the Neighbors. same property. Yeah. Okay. I'm also going to send you a picture of what he looks like now. Because, actually, I think Kato has aged really well. 
And I think he looks better now. Still a himbo, but like just like a different kind of himbo. I think most people look better than their court photos, especially too. Well, yeah, the lighting in court is so bad. <laughs> and I think it's intentional. They're trying to strip you of your yeah of your, human of your hotness. <laughs> yeah, same thing. Hotness will sway a jury, but I think he looks great. He's aged really well. He's definitely had some work. Like there is some Botox going on, but I'm not mad about it. Oh yeah, here's him, 1995. Yeah. Oh damn. I don't know if the internet works this way. He had Even very his... long hair back in the day. He's giving like Fabio love interest on Charmed. Yes. Like... <laughs> very made like, for TV. Are... Yeah. Not maybe not movies, but one hundred percent TV. I sent his I sent his IMDb page. Like look at yeah. like a picture of him now. His most recent headshot. Yeah, he still looks amazing. He still looks great. He's chiseled. Yeah. He's working it. And he is like, he's got like the the archetypical like himbo personality as well. Like kind of dumb, very sweet, just wants to do the right thing kind of guy. Mm -hmm. Friend to everyone. We'll watch your kids. <laughs> we'll watch your kids. Your kids love him. <laughs> he doesn't, he doesn't quite know why because he's a little stupid. <laughs> I love him. I, I want to protect him. <laughs> So, like I said, like, he, Kato and Nicole, Kato, Kaylin and Nicole were not interested in each other romantically. They were just platonic besties. But uh, on another trip to Aspen, she meets a guy that she is romantically interested in, who is a restaurateur named Keith Zlomzevich. So, so Keith, she and Keith date for a little while. According to Keith, in an interview with the Daily Mail, uh, one night he and Nicole, uh, like early on when he and Nicole were dating, they were at the Mezza Luna restaurant in Brentwood uh, with friends, which I think, I think he worked there at the time. I'm not 100% sure. And OJ's Bentley came like screeching up outside, quote, OJ walks in, comes straight over to our table, slams his hands down, and looks me straight in the eye and says, I'm OJ Simpson, and she's still my wife. Jesus. After that, which also, like, no, she's not. She divorced you. Yeah. <laughs> like, like but he thinks that she's her property. He, he yeah. thinks that she's his, his property. Yeah, um, when he says wife, he doesn't mean, like, lawfully wedded wife. He yeah. Means. He, he means, means like I own this woman. I've had sex with her and therefore you can't have her. Yeah. After that, according to Keith, Nicole started to tell Keith about some of the abuse. He would beat her and lock her in closets at hotels because she asked where he was when he was out cheating on her. She was told how to look, how to wear her hair, how to dress, told where to be, told what time to be there, how to be everything for OJ Simpson. So... OJ starts ramping up the stalking and intimidating because he knows that she's out there sleeping with other men. And one night, Keith and Nicole spotted OJ while they were at the Roxbury. So they left and they, were, they went back to Nicole's place. And apparently, OJ followed them back to hers and sat out in the bushes outside of her house, watching them through the window. And he watched her go down on Keith uh, and then he came back the next morning and confronted her about it. In the interview, Keith said, the next day he came over and pushed in the back door and confronted both of us, but he wanted to talk to her alone. She was trembling no. standing next. Yeah. <laughs> she was trembling standing next to me and holding my hand shaking. And she said, Keith, I think you need to leave me alone with him for a few minutes. She left with OJ. And when she came back, Keith said, she was white as a ghost. And she turned to me and said, Oh my God, Keith, he watched us. That's so fucking terrifying. And I can imagine being her and being like, no, you need to leave me alone with him because if not, it will be worse. Yeah. Like, I know exactly what she was thinking. I yeah. don't want to be alone with him, but I have to be because like, if we say, if we defy him and we say no, he'll start breaking things gonna... and yeah. beating us. But... Because this is a story of abuse and like abusive romantic relationships are – any abusive relationship is difficult to leave. leave. But 
abusive romantic relationships in particular are like very well known for being difficult to leave. Later in 1993, Nicole ends up kind of wanting to get back with OJ. She wants to have the life that she had before. She wants their family to be together. I think she, I, I think this is like a huge part of it because she, she copies their wedding tape and sends it to him. And I think she's just like really missing the idea of being a wife and, a, and having a family. Yeah. So she starts sending him letters and like asking him if they can maybe reconcile. And at this point, OJ actually has kind of moved on-ish. He started dating a woman named Paula Barbieri. Do you know Paula Barbieri at all? No. Paula was a absolutely gorgeous model, and I'm going to send you some pictures of her. He always get. I mean, he was very handsome, but he always gets like very beautiful women. No, oh, she's so you. pretty. I'm going to send you a couple of pictures her of her. People always say that she looks a little bit like Julia Roberts. Yeah, I can see that. The big she's smile. Got, she's got a big mouth. Yeah, big lips. <laughs> and big hair. She's gorgeous. Like that Julia Roberts woman. Big <laughs> mouth. <laughs> big lips. <clears throat> big lips, big hair, like Julia Roberts. She's giving Julia Roberts and pretty woman. She is gorgeous and okay more cameos before she was before paula was in an abusive relationship with oj and it was abusive not as much not probably not to the extent of nicole that we know not to the extent of nicole but still like was very abusive before she was in abuse in an abusive relationship with oj she was in a in an abusive relationship with dolph lundgren who played like all the Germans and oh and, yes okay <laughs> and Russians and all the eighties films the like hot yeah. blonde guy yeah I think he's actually like Swedish or Danish or something but like she was in, she was no in a weird toxic relationship with him first and then weird cameos everywhere so Paula grew up in Florida and her mother's relationships with both her father and her stepfather were profoundly abusive like a lot of early childhood memories of being in the other room while her mother was being like physically abused so paula swore that she would never let a man lay hands on her like that and it seems that she never did however she was kind she did have a blind spot to the ways that like her relationship with oj was abusive in other ways yeah, yeah. there were there were definitely some abusive dynamics he definitely still like blew up at her about little things including any time she would dare to talk to another man and then there were other times where he wasn't like there were times where she she was very briefly married um before him and there was a time that she met with her ex-husband and oj came home and and saw him there at at her house like meeting with him and was like totally fine with it and in the end she ends up using that as like a kind of way of being like well see he was reasonable and it's like again i feel like maybe there are ways in which he wasn't as abusive of you because the circumstances of your relationship with him were different than the circumstances of his relationship yeah. with nicole and like maybe if the relationship had gone on for many years longer or had happened earlier then it, it would have been the same situation yeah i don't know he also cheated on Paula a lot, like he did with every woman that he was ever with, including with Nicole, like while they were divorced. Uh, he slept with her a few times. And during their period, like he and Nicole's period of reconciliation, he like he really strung Paula along. Like he he would be fully in the relationship with her. And then like when Nicole wanted to reconcile, he would like d fucking disappear and he would be with Nicole. Mm. So Paula felt like her main rival in the relationship was Nicole, and she frequently wished that Nicole would just disappear. Nicole and OJ uh, do start to reconcile and see one, one another again, and uh, sort of just as this is happening, she buys herself an apartment, a different apartment near Rockingham that doesn't have a guest house. So OJ is like, well, Cato... Uh, living with my ex-wife slash girlfriend under the same roof would be improper. Like it was fine when he was in the guest house, but like now that he would be under the same roof, this is not okay. Yeah. But also he goes to Cato and he's like, this bitch is charging you reduced rent. Whereas if you come and live in my guest house, you can live there for free. And so Cato takes him up on the offer 
And Nicole loses another friend and confidant to OJ. Because OJ this entire time is charming all of their friends. And he's like, well, you can come live with me for free instead of living with my ex-wife. That would be weird. It would be weird if you live with my ex-wife still. But you can come live in my house. I won't charge you rent like she does. And Cato and Nicole kind of have like a falling out over it and never talk again. It's it's not like a brutal falling out. Like when when he kind of realizes that like uh, his first thought is like, oh, she needs the rent. Like she needs the money I've been paying her. Yeah. Um. And and he goes to her and he's like, I will if you need me to pay. Like I I will move in with you. Like no problem. And she was like, it's not the money. He's manipulating you. Like, even while she's trying to get back together with OJ, she's yeah. like, he's turning you against me. And Cato doesn't understand that. And she's like, it's fine, whatever. And they never really speak again. <sighs> These are the moments, the like, the like little, the little like social interactions that have, well, I guess this wasn't really like yeah. a little one, but like, it feels the little. More, the more people are educated about the signs of abuse and what abusers do and how they operate and how they isolate their victims, what it looks like, Mm -hmm. what the patterns are, the more able people are in those moments, those moments, which are like literally like defining moments where someone could have helped you. Someone could have been there. And I know you can't like, you can't look at it and be like, Oh, well, if this didn't happen, then this wouldn't happen. Cause we have no way of knowing any of that. But like the fact that he didn't get, what she was trying to say is like so he didn't understand to me yeah and there there was no way for him to have understood really no. because at that time especially like even now the way people would be like well she's going back so if it's fine yeah. for her then like why isn't it okay for me to he would just be, be so blindsided kind of thing. yeah which is why, like, the the first thing that his mind jumped to when he knew that she was upset was, like, oh, is it about the money? Because if yeah. you need the money, like, I will move in with you. Like, I'm happy to pay yeah. rent. And she was, like, it's not about the money. And, like, you – he just didn't understand. Like, I don't – I don't – I don't blame or judge Kato Kalin at all. And when it comes down to it, like, when she ends up dead, like, Kato Kalin, like, he believes that OJ did it. Like, mm-hmm. but – we also forget that, like, we still forget that, like, really nice guys do horrible things. Really yeah. kind, generous people who care about you and care about other people and even care about their victims do awful things. And mm-hmm. I think that is, like, the mindset that Cato Kalen was in at the time. So it was like, well, my really nice friend offered me his guest house for free, but also like I'm a good friend. I'm your friend first. So I'll like, if you need my rent money, but like, I don't understand you're dating him. Like everything should be fine. Like that's a, that's a conversation that I think would still stump most people today, much less like before we had really like, this was at a time. Nicole's death was one of the big cultural moments that brought intimate partner abuse into the spotlight. Like intimate partner violence was never really talked about before the 1990s. Even I can't even I I can't remember when like spousal rape was outlawed, but it was like relatively recently. So this is just like nobody had the verbiage to discuss this at the time. Can you hear the espresso yeah. machine going on next door? Not me leaning into my microphone. <laughs> this is where the sound goes and comes from. <laughs> it's like Ugh. vibrating my asshole right now. It's so loud. <laughs> I hate living in a small apartment. Hey, everybody, join our Patreon. <laughs> this video is brought to you by Nespresso. Oh, my God. Do you want to take an ad break? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> While we're talking about making money and moving into maybe some soundproof departments, should we take a fucking ad break? Yes, please. In 1993, OJ and Nicole took a trip to uh, Cabo San Lucas with friends in Mexico. During a conversation at dinner, apropos of of Cabo San San Lucas is like 
when I almost got married, my ex wanted to go there for our honeymoon so bad. It's like the expensive part of Mexico. It's like the really expensive vacation town that all the celebrities go to. Okay. It's supposed to be beautiful, like, but you know I've definitely heard what? of Mexico. <laughs> yeah. The, the country and the food. Yes. <laughs> Mexico yes. food, you know? So there's a lot of parts of Mexico that it were that are absolutely stunning, but Cabo San Lucas is one of those places, but it's also like very expensive and okay. that's where all the rich people go. Is uh, it like resorty? So, yeah. Okay. Everything is like an all inclusive resort. Gotcha. Okay. So they go with friends in nineteen uh ninety-three, I think towards the end of ninety-three. And either toward the end of ninety-three or like early ninety-four. Doesn't matter. Either way. During a conversation at dinner, apropos of nothing, OJ told their friends that Nicole was deathly afraid of frogs. He was working on an A-Team-esque TV show at the time called The Frog Men, and he turned to Nicole and he said, Hey, baby, that's me. I'm the frog man. And then when he walked away, Nicole said that that wasn't funny and that she was afraid OJ would kill her one day. What do you what do you make of that? What do you make of that weird conversation? Your partner out of nowhere is like, "Hey, did you know my partner's phobia?" Also, by the way, here's like a weird way I'm related to it. If I had to make an assumption based on absolutely nothing, uh, which I am going to do because this is a podcast, um, yeah. I think while he may have meant something by that, I think it was probably much more meaningful to her. Mm-hmm. Um, in his head, he's like, she's afraid of frogs. She's afraid of me. Yeah. But like. Ha <laughs> ha. Funny. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But to her, that fear is real. It's tangible. It is ruling her life. Right. Yeah. yeah. Whereas for him, that fear is like, that's something he enjoys. That's something yeah. he needs and clearly has no problem with. Yeah. So I, I think it would be really weird but I also maybe he was a very weird person who said very like like sort of oddball things like that in these kind of like weird situations but like that's a very like shitty threat like if you're gonna formulate a threat like an actual threat using like similar like you using like the this weird like not real connection connection like I, f- I feel like you could just be like she's afraid of frogs and like like i'm the frog man like i i i, right. I think it was more meaningful to her than it would have been to him but i that doesn't Absolutely. mean it wasn't a threat doesn't mean he wasn't enjoying her fear which is like right. is a threat in its own right yeah yeah i don't i don't even think it was like an intentional threat i honestly think he was like just trying to very cruelly joke about her yeah i I think he thought he was making a joke and he like his way of joking is to be cruel and for her and i think for a lot of people who are suffering through um bad relationships be they abusive or just otherwise bad like sometimes it's like these little things that like make you be like oh shit i i hate this i'm unhappy and that seems to be the case for her there's also these little moments where, like, the reality of it, like, bumps up against, like, your social life. Like, he's saying mm-hmm. this in public. Yeah. Like, there's that feeling of, like, nobody here is going to do anything. Like, this is happening in front of my friend, like, or, like, the people that I know or, like, who were they yeah. with? Was just it friends. Some friends. friends. Okay. And-, and, like, just being able to say something like that. Like, if, yeah. like, if my partner ever like turned to you and like made a comment like that you would be like the oh, fuck like i'd be like what does like that, that even that, mean that, that, yeah. i'm the frog man what <laughs> one, does that fucking one, what mean you, one i'm the frog man is a Are coconut you high? thing to say to somebody yeah but like like the idea of somebody turning and being like yeah they're they're scared of this and uh, and that's me like that's a weird thing i so i almost got married one time and the relationship was like profoundly emotionally abusive. Uh, and one thing that I do remember, like we we worked on a cruise ship for a period of time together. And as part of our job, we like sometimes had to like go have dinners with some of the guests, which is like fine. It's great or whatever. And like a lot of them wanted to have dinner, like us as the entertainers would have dinners individually, but a lot of the guests wanted to have dinners with the couple. So like he and I would always be sent together to have dinner as a couple as opposed to other people go separately. 
Yeah. And I remember like he would like he was British, so he would be like he would like make these like mean spirited jokes, like, oh, I've tried to explain rugby to her, the old ball and chain, but she's too stupid to understand. And I was like, in reality, it was like, no, you never you never talk about rugby with me. You don't want me involved in that part of your world, which I'm fine with. Like, I'm fine with you having yeah. things outside of me. But it was moments like that that I think really clicked with me more so than, like, some of the, like, more egregious stuff, like the stuff that, like, my mom would have to remind me of, where I'd be like, yeah. why does he why does he talk about me like this? Like, why does he talk about me like he doesn't like me and, like, he resents yeah. me and, like, he looks down on me? And I really think that it's, like, moments like that that, like, make you, when you're in, like, a toxic relationship, realize, like, how toxic it is because it's, like, you humiliate me in front of people like either our friends or like people that we don't even know because you think it's fun and funny and you think that you can have like a moment of communion with these like other men by humiliating the women in your life. And like that, I think, I don't know. It like, I, I feel like a, I feel like a, a, a strange kinship with Nicole in this respect mm -hmm. as well. Um, because this is like a moment where she decides that the reconciliation is not, reconciling yeah. it's not reconciling uh she's like this is over and like he he humiliates me in front of my friends and this is genuinely a man who's like mocking the fact that i am afraid of him and the fact that he knows like like it's just everything is very on the table and yeah like yes he was like He's sort flaunting of it. or whatever but like not really he's flaunting like it. yeah in front of people that they know, which is also, like, something that you do when you want to isolate someone. Yeah. Well, one, it's a power move, showing mm -hmm. that, like, see, these people aren't going to do anything. But two, if you start being really unfun to hang out with because there's always a fight yeah. or you make then people uncomfortable, people stop coming around, people stop making plans, they don't want to come over to your house, they stop answering your calls, like, yeah. this is part of isolation isn't just like like a lot of it is using like force to stop someone from reaching out by like by making your partner's life unpleasant every time they do there's always going to be a fight there's always going to be a problem yeah. and it becomes more work and less safe every time you do reach out to these people so eventually you just stop yeah. and that's like that's one of the main ways they do it but often when there's like direct contact like that the isolation comes from making being around this person unbearable because you're always there like the partner's always mm -hmm. with them when they're out in public and every time they come out or they come to your house they make a scene they make people uncomfortable like it's ugh. or the Did partner she... knows the way to push your button so that you become yeah. unbearable to be around yeah was sorry this was this recounted by the friends? Is that where mm -hmm. we're getting the story? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All of this stuff about her saying, like, he's going to kill me, that kind of thing. These are all stories that the friends came forward with after she died. Did any of them do anything before she died? Yes and no. There were people that encouraged her to leave. And then there were other people, especially family members, who were like, I think you need to try to make it work. I think it is like this case of, like, everybody sees, like – like a, a little snapshot of the abuse, but nobody sees mm -hmm. the totality of it. Yeah. So like, I mean, even you and I who have like experiences with this, like in our personal lives and also with like friends of ours, like we can see one instance of like a domestic dispute of some kind and just like write it off and be like, this is just like an argument that they're having. But like, it's only if you get to see a totality of evidence that you're like, okay, this is a problem. Yeah. One one argument in isolation is is not going to convince you. And yes, towards the end, like after they were separated, she did tell a lot of people, I think he's going to kill me. And some people took that seriously and some people didn't. I don't blame the people who didn't. I don't either. So to it speak. Just sucks. Like it's it's not their responsibility. And like no. I don't like I Again, like I don't I don't I don't know Nicole. Like maybe she seemed like someone who was this is the thing, like 
part of like the system of abuse is like making the victim seem unreasonable the, the, or dramatic. Yeah. And like I could see like very easily being con- convinced that like I love Nicole, but she's like a bit of a drama queen. So like she's going to exaggerate yeah. things. And it's like actually she wasn't exaggerating. She was telling you exactly how it was. You just didn't see the totality of her relationship. Mm-hmm. And you thought it was an exaggeration. And actually she was kind of like downplaying a lot of it. Well, yeah. And especially when you've gone back, there's not yeah. that much people are going to say to you. Like yeah. at that point, a lot of people do the thing that I think at some point we all actually do in some ways have to do and say like, if she needs me, I'm here. If she asks for something, I'm here, but I can't be involved, keep getting involved and in telling her yeah. to leave or whatever, because she's not ready. Yeah. That's the other painful thing too. And you don't like, you don't leave until you 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 need to you can you're leave. Ready. Yeah, I've or Jesus, like I've tiptoed very carefully around other friends who have had like abusive relationships where until they actually say, "I'm leaving, I'm getting out of this," I'm like, "He's so nice, and I get why you love him, but like that was like not an okay thing to do." Where I have to like play this like fun push and pull game because if you outright say like this is fucked up he's abusing you leave that person will cut you out of their life instantly and they will tell their partner that that you said that no it doesn't help them at all they'll tell your partner yeah yeah you will never have access to them again so you have to play this game where you're like i love oj oj is such a good guy i think sometimes he loses his temper and at those times he does things that he regrets and then you can't actually say until she's gone. Like, yeah. yeah, that entire time I was like worried for you and crying for you. And and I didn't say the things that I wanted to say because I was afraid I would lose you. Like, I've definitely had to like cross that line before it was before I thought the time had come. Right. Just because like there's also that nagging thought in your head where it's like, what if they just need a single person to validate them? And yeah. that might be enough for one person to say, you're actually not crazy. Right. And the, it's, the risk there is so high. But if a, a friend ever turned, if a friend ever turned to me and said, he's going to kill me one day, like the way. Witness if, protection right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, that was like the way I would be like, okay, we're getting a go bag. <laughs> like <laughs> you live with me now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, we'll bring Angus to the shelter. <laughs> and we live in Wyoming? In <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you live with me now. Uh, we have different names. Yeah. I, I'm growing a mustache. It's going to take a lot of minoxidil. <laughs> and so are you. <laughs> oh. It's so upsetting. <sighs> There's no right. There's, There's no, no right way. Right answer. And every single thing you do can potentially end the mm-hmm. worst possible way. So it's like. Yeah. I'm I'm not judging her friends. I just wanted to know if like if at any point yeah she got that validation. And it sounds like she did. Like friends took photos for her. Like even his friends after the fact. Like a lot of his friends live with the guilt, um, and will will take it to their graves and and fully believe that he did it. Does anyone Um, believe he didn't do it? I guess maybe we'll get to that. I think there's the still members of the public who believe that. No person like in his life, yeah. maybe his kids. His kids don't talk about it. That's but right. like his best friends, his a- former agent, like everybody close to him. I mean, they all asked him after he got off. They all asked him and they were like, did you do it? And he gave some kind of like weird version of no that was kind of a yes. Like <sighs> they all know that he did it. He did it. Yeah. It is my, we don't have lawyers. Our lawyer tells us that he, that I need to say that I, it is my belief, my He's alleged dead. belief that he did it. I don't He's know dead. if his kids, can't sue his us. kids won't try to sue us. Yeah. Fuck him. He did it. He did it. Well, fuck you it. and your dumb kids too. Like, they're going to sue me. I'm going to change my name. I have a go bag right now. <laughs> I'm growing a mustache as we speak. <laughs> You can't sue me. I'm growing a mustache. Sorry, I'm getting on Amazon right now and ordering minoxidil <laughs> for my face. 
<laughs> rubbing Rogaine all over my face, getting like a patchy beard that's like up to here. <laughs> like very convincing. Lopsided. And you look exactly like you, just with like a patchy beard. <laughs> You're like, well, I'm obviously not going to change my gorgeous hair. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, can you imagine like thick hair like this, and then like a like a beard, like a like a lumberjack yeah. beard? That is. I would have made such a hot like... man. <laughs> oh, the hair would be amazing though. Yeah, the hair and the beard. I would still have to have – I would have to have long hair as a man. Oh, of course. Long hair, long beard. (sighs) All right. Anyway, I'm stalling. (laughs) In October of 1993, Nicole made another 911 call during a domestic dispute during which OJ was attempting to break down the door to get to her. This is the one that I thought of earlier where she just sounds exhausted and she's like, you know who he is. It's OJ Simpson. I call you guys all the time. He can be heard in the background of the tape screaming about the blowjob she'd given Keith like a year earlier. Jesus. Yeah. In May, by May of 1994, according to Nicole's diary, the reconciliation had officially come to an end. They were, in her words, officially split. In the last year and a half of her life, Nicole became very close friends with a Beverly Hills socialite named Faye Resnick. The media really fucking laid into Faye Resnick because she was like new money and because she was like very open about the fact that she suffered with cocaine addiction um and you know like having addiction is that means you're a fallen woman you're a bad person yeah a woman with an addiction a man with an addiction as long as he overcomes it that is a story of triumph a woman with an addiction and if it's alcohol at the time it's also just fine That's not an addiction. That's just like having a good time on Saturday and Sunday and also Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. (laughs) That's not an addiction. Am I addicted to water? No. As long as it's clear, it's fine. I'm not not an alcoholic. I only drink clear liquors. (laughs) Oh, I'm saying that from now on. So skinny. So locale. So ozempic coated. Everything with everything that's clear is also zero calories. I, it's so true. <laughs> I believe it. The um, color where is where you calories? get the calories. <laughs> do you see? I don't any see calories? them. Do you? I don't see them. <laughs> Checkmate libs. <laughs> While Nicole and Faye were friends, uh, Faye said that Nicole did cocaine very rarely, but was fond of her tequila shots when they went out to the clubs. <sighs> In the book, Faye Resnick wrote about Nicole, Nicole Brown Simpson, The Private Diary of a Life Interrupted. Faye describes how one night, shortly before her death, Faye and Nicole had a brief sexual encounter. They were both seriously going through it. Faye was suffering through addiction, and Nicole was being terrorized by OJ, stalking her and threatening to kill her if she slept with another man. And they came back to Faye's place after partying one night, and they ended up sleeping. (sighs) <sighs> the loophole. <laughs> he said I can't sleep with another man. Man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so they come back to Faye's apartment after partying one night and they end up sleeping together in like this like very sweet little story. Like the way that like two hurt people just like come together sometimes, you yeah. know. It was like, you know, they were trauma dumping on each other and then they just started making out. I honestly think that's a little romantic. It's so sweet. Like, it I'm, honestly I'm makes me want to cry. I'm a very messy person, but, like, the fact that they found that, like, comfort and solace in in their friendship. And each other, yeah. In that way, like, that's not me being, like, they were friends and roommates, but, like, maybe yeah. there was something more. But, like, it sounds like it was It more feels just, like that, though. Like, the way yeah. Faye talks about her, she doesn't talk about her like, we were a couple. She talks about her like... We were best friends and we had this one night of like extreme intimacy, but like she was my friend. She's my friend. And sometimes you have sex with your best friends. Sometimes you have sex with your best friends. It's totally fine. (laughs) Especially when you're both going through it. Like sometimes it's like I'm being stalked. I'm addicted to cocaine and I just need my best friend to flick my bean. A tale (sighs) as old as time. (laughs) Tune is all to song. <laughs> so they end up sleeping together and like falling asleep, and they're woken up by flashlights in the window, and they immediately are like, "Oh my Jesus god, it's OJ! Christ. It's OJ again! He's come to find us!" But it's not OJ; it's the, it's the police. 
Ooh, it's a soundscape. It's a soundscape. Can you hear the police in the background of my apartment? Oh, I thought that was Charles or G- George. Who is the, the Alan. street urchin? Alan! Um, <laughs> Alan's also out there too, but <laughs> there's also <laughs> they're, like they're after cops. Him. There's a siren Sirens. going on. Yeah. Anyway, it is the cops. It's not OJ. Uh, and the cops are like, you're playing music too loud. So they turn the music off and they laugh and they go to bed. Okay. <sighs> Which I just think is like a cute little little button on that story. What a lovely uh, night. I know. You just have like this like moment of like trauma bonding with your bestie. And then like you think you're, you're both still so anxious that you think the trauma has arrived. And it's not the trauma. It's just the police. And you're both white women. I mean- so you're fine. <laughs> don't worry it's just the police and we're white it's okay they'll go away <laughs> we're white and rich oh yeah <sighs> three days before her death nicole organized an intervention for Faye with all of their friends and drove Faye to rehab a few hours before the murders nicole and Faye talked on the telephone nicole had planned to come visit Faye in rehab the next day and she asked Faye if she could maybe bring her anything Seize candies, maybe? That was Nicole's favorite. And that was the part during my research process where I had to stop and play Stardew Valley for like six hours. (laughs) Because, like, the little. And, like, the last conversation you have is your friend asking if she can bring you candy while you're feeling poorly, while you're in rehab. And then the next time you hear about her, she's dead. She's supposed to come see you the next day, and she doesn't make it. It's like the pedestrian little details that really yeah. kill me. Like, that that could be a conversation between us, you know? Yeah. Just like, oh, you're sick. Can I send you something? Please. Yeah. Yeah. So Faye never sees her again. Um, and after the fact, Faye ends up going through like um, hypnotherapy to try to remember every conver- every detail of the conversation that she had with Nicole on the phone. But she just can't remember everything. But she does remember That's... that little last detail of just like, I'll see you tomorrow. Can I bring you some candy? Hypnotherapy to remember conversations is just like paying for false memories anyway. It's fake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not real. It's not real. But honey. I'm glad... I'm glad she has, like, at least that. Yeah. So I think now, I think we're, I'm going to bring the the conversation to an end because we've been going for three hours and 18 yeah. minutes at this point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and we're, we're coming up to the day of the murder. So I'm going to, I'm going to call it here. <sighs> Kaylin, do you, do you have any pluggables to plug? I don't even care. I have a YouTube channel, Kaylin Conrad. That's me. <laughs> Dope. <laughs> I'm like, this is too depressing. I'm not like, oh, we're at, we're at her death. Subscribe to my Patreon. <laughs> we're, we're technically stopping on the evening of June 11th, 1994. So okay. she's still alive for now. Her... Okay. Well, then I guess do subscribe to her Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> she's still alive for 24 more hours. <laughs> subscribe Before to her Patreon. Too late. If enough oh, of you God. subscribe at ten thousand dollars a month a person, uh, we just won't do an episode two, and she'll be alive forever. Oh, we'll cancel like episode two. The clapping to keep Tinker Bell alive. It's like donating for us to shut up. Yeah, by my silence. Oh, it's like turning off a movie like three quarters of the way through. Like City yeah, not of switching Angels tapes for really- Titanic. <laughs> Yeah, like City of Angels, like without the last like 25 minutes is actually really pretty. Banger. (laughs) I'm Hoots. You can find me. Well, you're watching my YouTube channel, so it'd be weird if you couldn't. But for those of you who are listening on audio, (laughs) you can find me at Hoots YouTube. You should go follow our podcast on the podcast channel. You can follow us on Spotify. We're Respect the Dead. On YouTube, we're respect the dead and we're underscore podcast. respect the dead on respect the dead podcast on yeah. youtube and on uh, twitter and instagram we are underscore slash underscore respect the dead and all of that will be uh, linked in our link tree description that's right so the next time you hear from me we will be talking about how nicole brown simpson's terrifying life came to an end at the age of 35 which is how old i am Thank you for doing this research, and I'm sorry you were the one to do this research. (laughs) Once again, it's a Hoots episode. Yeah.
feel like shit. Also, there will not be a morgue this week because we are saving our morgue for for our Patreon patrons. Uh, if you sign up for Patreon, yeah. you can um, uh, get access to bonus episodes uh, where we do kind of like these uh, episode um, debriefs. Uh, but yeah. we will be saving the debrief, the morgue, for this episode for the conclusion of the series. And then we'll have like yeah. kind of a longish morgue following that one. So there will not be a morgue this coming Thursday. You'll have to wait for the conclusion of the OJ series. And yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to go okay, drink myself to death. <laughs> Bye. Bye.